What's up, guys? My name is Nick Hemstreet, and today I got Alec from ATF Magazine. And um, say what's up, man. Introduce yourself. I am Alec Olson, like you said, ATF Magazine. Uh, I've been smoking cigars for a long time and, and decided to, with me that I work for six months, um, decided to be part of creating a, a magazine that's all about alcohol, tobacco, firearms, the things we love doing when we're not working, we turn in work. So all the good things. That's been our, yeah. So the things that make America tick, the, that the that's... government hates. Yeah, right. Yeah. You, you know, it's funny. Um, even before I ever found out about your guys' magazine, I, I found out right as you were doing the first issue with Matt Booth. And yeah. um, um, so uh, as my listeners know, I, I'm a huge fan of Matt Booth's uh, Farce Maduro. Um, yeah. I, I don't know, man. I just love that cigar. Like, you nailed it. I, 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 I don't know what it is. Um, just it, it really strikes my palate really well. Anyway, so when I, I think I was following him on your page, he posted yeah. it. And, and um, uh, I think his exact words, Matt Booth style is, Thanks, ATF Magazine, for putting me on the t- front cover of your Maggie or something like that. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, yeah. That's, yeah or something like that. Um, and before ever finding out about your guys' magazine, I thought it was, I thought it'd be really cool because it was right at the start where YouTube algorithm was like um, demonetizing channels like so anything. Yeah, real with. bad, real bad timing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I was like, man, someone's got, and then I think Cigars Daily, like Tim, he was mm-hmm. like saying that how, how he, he started his, um, um, what's, what's he calling it? The Cigars Plus Daily. Yeah, Cigars, Cigars Daily, Daily Plus, Plus, I think. Yeah. And I was like, man, that's a great idea, but we, there should be a platform with cigar, you know, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms where it's a YouTube or thing for all of yeah. us that like these things because we're getting banned yeah from even companies like like bovid i was talking to rob and it, it's like their struggle is do we have on youtube or do we move it to vimeo because their youtube videos are just like slowly disappearing because youtube's like nope that one's off the list that one's off the list and uh and to be able to similar to tim to have a place that can host content that's not going to get banned yeah at the end of the day, I guess Google can decide what they want to do, but we're not there yet. Um, and so, well, I mean, and we'll get into this, but I think media specifically needs a platform, which everybody's go- been going after their version of it. That's not going to be suppressed. Yeah, That's not going to be, I don't know. If it, it, Freedom of speech needs to be valued a lot higher than it is. and And so... As, and it, yeah and so in the magazine we're like these are the things we love doing these are the things that have been a part of the country forever um and and they're the things that just, that bring people together and so yeah. in a really unique way that i don't think many other things do and, and all kind of in their like alcohol tobacco and firearms all do it individually uniquely yeah but they blend together so well so that's uh I mean, that is what, what, our... a, what a perfect, you know, my co-host Ryan uh, and I were joking is like, what, like, what else do you need, man? <laughs> you know, like, you know, uh, I mean, those three, you got to eat are... eventually. Yeah, you got to eat. So that's about it. That's about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, but okay. So, so you are the marketing yeah. advisor or marketing who, marketing manager marketing person marketing guy okay um yeah so to take to take you back to kind of the, the core of what we do so 526 media group as a publisher we have publications going back to 1922 that like through every world war since then have not skipped a beat but they're all in the building products space primarily um and the primary demographic that those serve are like contractors, lumber mills, um, uh, like hardware stores, just that whole building product space. And and we're looking at it like we have these relationships with the core of American bedrock industries. Like if these people, something that our owner Patrick always says is if these people stop going to work for a week, the world shuts down or even a day. Like those are the people we want to focus on 
part of it is that business is going to be there forever. Um, and there are the unsung heroes. Those are the people that work day in and day out. And if they stop, the entire planet feels it. And, and so we had relationships with these people, but it was only a relationship from uh, our business to theirs and then their business to their customers. But it, it didn't branch out didn't branch out past that. Um, and so we we're like, what, what do these people do when they're not working? What do we do when we're not working? What do we enjoy? What brings us together? Um, and our big thing was specifically like alcohol and, and cigars. Like we, everybody on the team has been obsessed with them for years and it fits that core demographic that the rest of our publications serve. Um, but then it allows us to tell more stories that are stories about, for lack of better words, American heroes that we just don't, we don't hear about. And so we've been able to, we've been able to sit down and interview some really interesting people. And I'm, I'm especially excited for this next issue coming out in the next couple of weeks. Because um, people open up in a way, especially when you don't have an agenda in a conversation. Yeah. Um, in a way that I, that I think people, around the country just need to sit and, and listen to like it's kind of like when you would i think we all have the stories of sit down with your grandpa or someone who's in in the war and like finally they've kind of relaxed and taken a step back from it and they're just telling their story and those are the stories that i think inspire people motivate people challenge people um and if we can initiate those conversations over a cigar over a drink um it just allows us to be open and authentic to our readers and so that's been that's been our goal is how do we have open conversations that will make our readers better educate um and then inspire people and the education piece too and i think kind of like what we were talking about before we started was if someone understands a product if they understand what they're smoking if they understand what they're drinking they appreciate it so much more yeah and we I love watching people light up with that type of thing for for sure i uh and some sometimes people you know there are some of there's some out there that don't care about understanding what it is they're doing they just enjoy it and kind of move on and it's uh, there's something there's yeah. everybody has something yeah yeah um but yeah it's so cool how those yeah those things are just so amazing and really make you like I, I like what you said the bedrock of what our country has been founded mm -hmm. on and and uh and, and should continue to be so and i went down to southern seminary in louisville and pretty pretty quickly i met this kid i had not met him at all before this, this kid from texas comes up to me he's like hey i don't know you really but for the rest of the semester every sunday uh at night we're gonna go to the park down the street and smoke pipes and talk about jesus and i'm like i don't smoke anything and he's like don't care you do now yeah uh and then he gave me just i think it was english tobacco and a corn cob pipe um and it was just the most harsh worst thing i've ever smoked and i'm like how do you like this he's like no nope, the problem isn't that you don't like this it's that you don't like this tobacco so we're gonna find you one and then for weeks he was just like trying to figure out what i would tolerate yeah just to come back the next time and then ended up finding it's like really aromatic cherry vanilla pipe tobacco um and then i was hooked yeah and i worked at a coffee shop at the time and i'm like okay coffee cigars great combo i was uh was i 19 at the time i think i just turned 19 um and then since then i was hooked and then i came back home here and then saw the little pipe packing tool in my pastor's keychain and i was like Wait a second. Wait a second. <laughs> uh, and then he brought me here uh, to this shop. And, and the rest is history. I've been coming in here for a long time. The first cigar he gave me, um, it is not the first cigar that I smoked, but it was the first one that I liked was the uh, My Father Connecticut. Okay. Um, the which 2K, is the two, four, uh, two, or isn't there a white? It's not, uh, it's not one of their like, more okay. limited blends it's okay it's, it's always on the shelf um which i was kind of surprised i liked it because it's pretty spicy but it's yeah. connecticut um 
And then ever since then, I've just been exploring the humidor, That's smoking awesome. everything I can, and then do some work for the shop now. So it's like I come in and he's like, all right, here's the new stuff. Here you go. So it's been it's been a great way to just get to know what's coming out, what's new um, and, tr- and try everything. You can't you can't judge it until you try it. And, and there's too many great creators in this space that maybe some of them are making too many. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, okay. Uh, but there's there's so many good cigars out there. You're just constantly around it then, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. And and so you work for ATF full time? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Nice. okay. So you, yeah. you went to Bible school. Yeah. And um you didn't go you were trying to study to be a pastor. I don't know what or, I was trying to study to or, be, but it was just fascinating. How, how'd you end up in marketing then? Two of my friends worked for this company, 526, before. Well, let me take a step back. The business model of this company since our current owner, Patrick, founded it has been acquiring previously existing publications. Okay. Um, And so the majority of them that we've, that we have that have been really the core of the business um, are ones that have gone back for years. One of those was a publication called Surface and Panel that was focused on like the high-end panel processing. Okay. World to like the like Ikea kind of stuff, like laminate. Okay. okay. Um, laminate surfaces, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, and they were based in Watertown, like two minutes from my house. And two of my best friends worked for them as interns, and then they got hired. And so when Patrick bought that magazine, they came with it. And all right. And so from when I left school till about two years ago, um, I was working at a printing company, flexible food packaging printing. So it's like Hershey and Mars and pharmaceutical and all that stuff. Um, and I was just tired, burning out. And the one of my buddies was leaving and he's like, uh, I know you're pretty run down from your job right now. I'm leaving. I don't know if they'd replace this position, but if you want, I'll put in a word with the owner. And, and then I think two or three days it was really fast like a few days later I, I talked with him and then I think I was working for him the next week nice that so went nice. that went real fast and that was before ATF was a thought it was the intent was marketing for the other publications and, and for the publisher um and then every time we would talk it was just like what are you smoking and kind of like conversations that you had uh and they're like there's something there's something here um and we had the publishing piece down so it was like the hard part of actually creating a magazine we're doing several a week so we had that bones for it already and then it was just the subject matter and then making the content huh? subject and the content yeah cool um so it's it's one of those things that it's like i still don't know what i want to do when i grow up but (laughs) you uh, both my friend but it's 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 just uh it's a journey it's been fun that's awesome. That's cool. Um, yeah, it's really cool how, how, I don't know, you guys just popped up on my radar. And then, so um, being an artist and my co-host being a photographer as well, Yeah, I must admit, um, a lot of magazines specifically, um, the, the, like I got the Matt Booth uh, one here, just the, oh, awesome. the photography alone, I'm a sucker for, right? Like I'm a sucker yeah. for just artistic, like cool shots and uh, he's on the back cover too but yep, like just, he's everywhere i mean i mean just uh and i i think i left your other one inside but just even even cool photos uh gets me you know and he's just like what a cool way of making yeah. what we do um showing it properly in my opinion of like making giving it justice that it deserves yeah. in an artistic manner which I think, you know, these are art and I think other you know, publications itself. like Cigar Aficionado, that's the big one. They have their place. And I think every cigar brand that exists right now owes a debt of gratitude to that publication. Because I think without that cigar, the industry as a whole would not exist in the way that it does now. Because they took what at one point was kind of the next step from 
I don't know, cigarettes almost. Yeah. And then added class to it, specifically to the US that wasn't really there in the UK. And in that market, it was very different. It was a lot more of a white collar sort of thing. Um, but they made that accessible and digestible for everybody else. And still, though, that publication focuses on like ads are like BMW and Rolex. And it's like this very high end yeah. uh, product. And again, that has its place. But we were like, we don't want it to be. Um, we wanted to celebrate the topics of alcohol, tobacco, and firearms through the content, through the photography, through the interviews, through everything, rather than it be a vehicle to sell other products uh, yeah. in that space. Well, and then you get down to the 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 whole thing where they do like the top twenty five or whatever at the end of the year, and it's all yeah like paid. I don't. So that's a uh, that's I mean, a rabbit hole. I don't. The more that I learn about it the more that I don't think it's paid, but okay. I think it's relationships that they've built for so long. Okay. Where like when they grab the 10 cigars or whatever it is, they just happen to be from okay. the relationships yeah. that they've built. And it's cool that like Half Wheel and Cigar Dojo and these guys are finally doing the consensus lists. Cause it's like, what are people actually buying? What are, what are you guys actually enjoying? Not what is this the people, panel of right? tasters yeah. like? And especially if that panel of, of people rating doesn't rotate it's like of course these guys this, their favorite cigar is going to continue to be the Patron 1926 yeah because it has been forever in their defense that cigar is perfect <laughs> so it's like <laughs> that cigar is awesome yeah that one yeah that's that's my if i could just pick a favorite cigar they win but okay um yeah there's there's so many good cigars and so my background was photography, like outside of my day job. And then our designer, Mitch, his niche was photography and design. And so we're like right off the bat when we were just like, we had notes and just a bunch of Adobe Illustrator projects just of ideas of, of what we want this to look like, what we want the vibe to be. We're like photography needs to be the main thing because end of the day when people flip through a magazine, some people read them most people kind of flip through it quick and they're like, Oh, cool picture. And the picture might lead them to read the yeah. article. I think it's like social media, right? Like, yeah. like Instagram, you're kind of doing that. You're like, Oh, yep. You Something know, stops I, you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and so we said for its existence, we want this to be design and photo focused um, and then have the content back up. Yeah. The design. Um, and when we took it to PCA, that was the, thankfully, that was the the response we got was photos like that, which we were super excited about because we we're hoping that it would stick and then it would resonate with with the industry as a whole. Um, and and I think it did. I, I hope it did. It, it seemed like it did. I mean, I, I, I've never been to PCA. Um, it's a goal I'd really love to do. I'd really love to do it for the podcast. Just to yeah. meet all kinds of different people. Um, but um, it is an exhausting thing. I, I could imagine. <laughs> it yeah. is. Uh, it's cool because it's everybody in the industry in one room for the most part. Um, it's definitely. I've heard. I'm. I'm not going this year, um, but I've heard TPE is the one trade show that's a lot more, or it's a lot less salesy. It's a lot less. Okay. What's TPE? Uh, I don't even know what it stands for. It's it's tobacco products something it's it's the other trade show it's the other big Florida trade show. as well is that... uh i'm not sure i think it might be in vegas as well oh okay, um, okay. Gotcha. that's right but i've heard that show companies and brand reps are a lot more relaxed because pca is the one where like they're launching their product for the next year so it's a big sales pitch um but everybody in the industry there like you sit down and talk to any of them and it's like they have nowhere to be they just they want to engage with the people who are giving them the support and the time of day to appreciate That's the product. That's what they're for, probably. Yeah. And, and it's yeah. cool that as big as the industry seems to be, especially like from the outside world, the second you go into a humidor, you start piecing it together and you're like, oh, there's not that many brands. There's a lot, but like most of them are here. That are doing then, it well. Yeah. yeah. And then you distill that down to the people who are actually making them and blending. And you're like, you could fit everybody that's 
everybody that's at anybody in the cigar industry into this lounge and that's pretty small um and they'd all get along and and you see that at shows like that because you've got like nick malillo and matt and all these guys running around to other people's booths and it's like a big family reunion which is just a super yeah. cool, like kind of non-competitive thing. And it's like, if we do better and if we do better then you do better because the industry does better and that's a unique thing. And I'm hoping, I, and I don't, I don't know if it'll be the same thing. We're going to shot show the, the gun trade show in Vegas in a couple weeks that I, I'm guessing is going to be a bit different, especially just because the nature of the product. Um, but the cigar industry specifically is the most community driven thing that I've seen. So, so my observation from having the podcast for about two years is I've been into a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, I don't know, just hobbies, I guess, if you will. Right. And I kind of look at cigars as a hobby is every other industry, including art, there's a, a sense of a bit of pretentiousness in terms of a, a reservedness of not wanting to share uh, certain information. Um, yeah. Whether intentionally or not intentionally, just the way that the nature flows kind of right. Yep. And I have, I couldn't say it's any more opposite for, for uh, cigars in regard to like, man, I have a list of like people I'd love to invite onto the podcast and people that um, I go to the Rocky Mountain Cigar Festival, for example. Here. Oh, cool. Um, and I've been going for many, you know, a number of years. And now that I have the podcast and I have the cojones, if you will, to actually approach people and like, hey, I have a small podcast, but, you know, um, I'd love to have you on the show if you're not. Everyone. Of course, let's do it. And that's yeah, how I, that's never how I met Travis, you know, um, yeah. to interview him. And I met Nick uh, from uh, Foundation. And, yep. uh, you know, we were kind of shooting the shit for a little bit. And he's like, yeah, of course. I'd, I'm like, what? Like, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, even on Instagram, uh, yourself included, there's just, um, I've, I've hit up Matt Booth and he said, yeah, sure. I, we still have to make it happen. But I literally have not gotten the answer of no or maybe or we'll no see who, who benefits ever. from them saying no ever they don't benefit even if i'm the small peon pawn guy that doesn't you know i mean it's it's what a cool thing to want to share their passion for this thing here and that... nobody and nobody in the industry is big enough where they can say no and it doesn't damage their reputation mm. and i and i think that's i think that's part of it because it's like they're big companies, but they're re- it's relatively small business. Yeah. Um, and it operates that way. And it's and, and especially a lot of these are family companies. And so they're like our family's name rides on how we relate to our customers and how we relate to media. And and they value that. And and maybe maybe they're putting on a face and they don't want to be there. But most likely if you give someone an opportunity to like, hey, you want to sit down for an hour and smoke but, a cigar and we'll have a camera on. But like, even yeah. e- even via Instagram, they could just not respond yeah like, to be quite honest with you and then they avoid and like well okay there's they're they're I think, too too big I think for what me, i found right? on instagram is if someone opens the message you're good <laughs> it's just getting them to open the message and then <laughs> yeah um and and so what a i don't know man it's just such a cool industry and and one that i've found what however small my chunk of of contribution there might be is it's a sense of of pride of, of like, yeah. what a cool thing. And, and it, and it comes out in that also that passion that I have for like sharing my love for cigars with other people. Cause I'm not a distributor. I'm not a roller. I'm not a cigar maker by any stretch, yeah. but I, I have the same passion for getting other people into them. And um, I see that with the big guys on down yeah. to us you know it's just like it's, that's so cool. marketing like this too is infectious like you like you might think your your reach is small or your small podcast but then it's like your your passion behind wanting to bring this product to other people that will stick with people because people are going to be like oh this guy's authentic he's excited yeah and he has a good product he's wanting me to try yeah it's different if you just gave someone crap and they're like oh sorry but it is subjective, but still, it's uh, the makers of this and the people who enjoy them are 
to get along in a way that I haven't seen in other in other industries. Um, people like like Nick always sticks out to me um, from Foundation because he's so excited about the history. Where I'd like I we interviewed him at PCA. I saw and that. He's like talking yeah. about Egypt and like just going super deep into the history of not even the product he's selling, just like the story behind the branding and what inspired him to get there. Um, he's it's he's like a kid in a candy shop all the time, just excited. Well, he has a he has an interesting story because um, Absolutely. I mean, he, he like he's from Connecticut, if I remember correctly, and he mm-hmm. uh, moved to Nicaragua just to like, all right, we're doing this. And um, he, yeah. he jumped into the deep end of the pool. And what a what, what a outstanding way of, of uh, incorporating yourself into an industry of just sheer. I, I respect that. Of, yeah sheer like some some people it comes like organically right and then um i feel i guess i relate to that because i think that's how i got into tattooing was just just sheer i was just gonna say that's that's like you with tattoos you're just like i'm doing this i don't care and nothing i'm gonna gonna do this until it works yeah 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 (laughs) try i might and it's just gonna happen you know yeah um, that's awesome what are you smoking by the way Oh yeah, I'm smoking the uh, Drew Estate Undercrown Maduro. Very good. Um, I, I like this. I I like a lot of. Um, I've smoked more Maduros. I think, like other people, um, I was intimidated by uh, Maduros up until about you know about two years ago when we started doing the podcast. And I'm like, okay, yeah. I gotta try some of these things, and what, what, a whole door opened up. What has your your journey through getting into cigars been like? Did you start with a specific brand and got really into it, or I have a very memorable. So I um I one of the first cigars I remember smoking. It wasn't the first one because you know I was probably smoking something garbage probably, and I yeah. think I actually started with like Swisher Sweets or something yeah, we all like did, that, you know, <laughs> um and like okay, and I want to try the real stuff. Um, but the first cigar I remember being like, whoa, this is awesome, was the um, Arturo Fuente Hemingway short story. Yeah. Uh, and that was a cigar. I think it was not intimidating because of the size at first. Yeah. And then the lounge that is no longer in existence here in Denver um, had one of those on the they didn't really have like a humidor that you could walk in, but they had like a menu that you could yeah. it was kind of a dinner place and whatever. And um, that was the first cigar that I was like, wait, what is, what is this? This is, this is really, um, I can see myself getting into this. Um, and yeah. And then I just kind of went from there to be honest with you. I mean, um, after I could start affording cigars after not the poor starving artist thing, yeah. um, and then uh, just, yeah, just started smoking more and more. And I think very early I got into the, not just smoking to, I think there's something to be said about smoking and sitting in your backyard and smoking a cigar. That's mm-hmm. one thing, but I think I really enjoy sitting down and actually thinking about what it is I'm smoking. Um, yeah. I wouldn't say I have a palate that by any stretch that, that is like, Oh, you know, it's rolled by a one-legged man on a unicycle, you know, <laughs> on a Thursday. Um, and, and so much so that I think initially I really had a, a, a hard time understanding, um, like some, a company like half wheel, um, was yeah. really difficult for me to grasp at first to the point where I was like, this is bullshit. <laughs> like, no. like now, now I understand the place and, and from a, from a perspective there, there are people that can taste crazy stuff. Yes. But, but my big thing when I'm in, introducing people into cigars, my friends um, and clients of mine that you don't have to, and I think that's an important distinction is you don't have to be able to pick out schnozberries to, or yeah. marzipan to be able to enjoy the cigar. Do you enjoy right. it? That's yeah. the important part. And this is what we're doing right now. That is what I so much like about cigars. Right. Half wheel. That, that reminds me. So when I, before, before ATF, 
I was like, I'm into cigars enough. I want to do something with this and I don't know how to do it and get paid. I was like, if I can get paid at least just to justify myself and going and buying more cigars, that's a win for me. Um, Cause like you said, like they're, they're not the cheapest things. If you're doing, if you're having like one a week, it's, that's fine. Um, but it does add up. <laughs> and yeah. so I was like, if I can, establish myself at some level as being a part of this industry from a media perspective that would be that would be awesome and so here i would take pictures of cigars that i'd smoke and put them on instagram or whatever um and the owner here was like hey can i reshare that photo and then this is just on my phone and then i did that for a little while and then i got a camera and i was like oh that looks a lot better <laughs> it was like this cheaper a canon m50 Okay. You need a good starter camera. That's those are amazing. Um and uh and then I was like, who can I talk to that might pay me to take pictures of cigars outside of here? Which here it was take photos and then smoke stuff when you come in and we won't charge you for it, which has been great. Um that, that's a great deal in and of Great itself. deal. Not boxes, but just like single yeah, sticks here and there. But well, but it lets me like... try stuff. Um and so I was like, what if I emailed the guys at Half Wheel? Like, there's no way they're going to reply, but I'll just try. So I emailed Brooks. He replied in like two minutes. And I was like, let's jump on a call. And then we talked for like two hours. Um, Right here. <laughs> and uh, I was like, so are you guys hiring? Because you guys have photos with, with every review. He's a professional photographer by trade outside of Half oh, Wheel. Is he? Okay. Yeah, he like pretty high level uh like documentary photography okay um nice, and so this is a a downgrade <laughs> to what yeah. he was doing before uh and he's like no we're not hiring for that but uh we have a beer site called tenemu and it's basically half wheel but for beer and i was like i know my way around beer enough that i could probably do this being in wisconsin yeah. um and he's like maybe we hire you for that and then we'll pay you to write articles and then for beer we can't get down to texas he'll just ship us beer <laughs> i'm like okay let's do that uh but that was enough of like a validation i think i'm like okay i have a relationship here in the cigar industry in the alcohol industry um that i can take to the next the next thing um and i met Brooks and Charlie in person for the first time at PCA this year. And I was like, you probably don't know this because the writing thing didn't last that long and they've closed that website. Um, but I was like, you're just a little bit of validation, which I was in the form of a no about my original request was enough to at least put me in the right circle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that is, it was, it was such a simple thing. Um, and I think like, like what you're doing just getting getting your foot in the right doors the things take off fast and then right. now you're like okay i'm a part of this industry i'm a part of it at, at some level yeah um, and, it, it's and that's funny. exciting to watch yeah. and it's exciting to be a part of it's funny that you mentioned that that was like your foot like uh having photography fit, um taken by the way uh my co-host uh ryan would approve being a canon guy <laughs> yeah uh, um uh i'm not a photographer uh i take photos for just sheer references for my paintings yeah. and tattoos um but um my goal when i when i propose the idea once again of the podcast of just doing it just for myself i'll edit it i'll learn how to do this thing yeah. cool whatever um when ryan came on board i go hey i'm just letting you know like don't hold out for like, uh, you know, don't, don't hold your, 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 we're probably not going to get paid at this, but my goal is if we, if we are able to e even get to the point where we're given cigars to like oh, cool. do that, yeah. I will edit videos and take podcasts and smoke for the cigars. rest of time. <laughs> like, you know, I'll twist my arm, man, you know? So yeah. uh, that was kind of, that's kind of uh, in, in terms of, how I knew that if I would succeed as an artist and be able to buy a box of cigars, my success, I guess, measurement, I guess your validation is one day if I'm able to even 
get to the point where I can like, I'm trusted enough to be given, you know, cigars that like, dude, this is awesome, man. Yeah. You know? And, um, that would be really cool. Uh, I, I, I really enjoy that. And well, I think I'll, that, uh, that I'll do what I can of, to get you more cigars. <laughs> that journey <laughs> of yours is, is really cool. And, and man, that's, that's such a cool story. So how did you learn how to write and I didn't. No, I, you I, didn't. Okay. I still so am. Just kinda, Every you, time I write, I'm like, I don't know yeah. how to write, but okay. it's nope. printed now. So it can't go away. <laughs> and uh, I, I didn't look in I the wrote, I wrote a bunch in school for the short stint that I was there. And I think, I think that helped a lot, actually. Because it was... I don't know if it was just at that school specifically, but the staff they had there held students to a super high standard. Okay. Speci- like specifically with writing because they were like and especially with apologetics was which was the whole premise of that is you're defending christianity okay it's it's the defense of it um and so you have to be able to hold your ground on paper um gotcha. and so between that okay. and philosophy i was like okay i learned how to at least write a little bit while i was there which i enjoyed which was a very different style of writing um but I feel like the sweet spot in this industry, half wheel is a very different thing because that's like a very, as objective as it can be review. It's not very detailed, like an emotional. Yeah. Like explaining the relationship with the cigar and the brand. It's just, this is what happened. This is what I'm tasting. This is the rating on to the next one. Um But I think if you're excited about something and you're genuinely passionate about it and you just start writing, which speech to text is the best thing because it doesn't give you the option to start like rethinking what you're saying. You just say it and then you can go back and edit it later. Um, Yeah. But if you can already talk about cigars for hours, you're you're good. (laughs) It's just like. I don't think the writing specifically is the thing. I think it's, are you passionate enough about this topic to be able to talk about it? Keep going, yeah. Yeah, or did you get refascinated enough about a relationship that you built to be able to put it on paper? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something that we've we've been learning. Like we have we have writers for our other publications. One of them, her, her husband was very high level in, in the military. Um, and she... I don't remember what the publication was called, but she made army or military magazines for years. Okay. Um, and she's like, I think I know what kind of the vibe that, especially with the firearm side of things, the vibe that readers want out of articles like this. And so she's been like a super helpful resource as we're writing uh, to be able to take something we write and actually make it not look like a monkey did it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and then, and start restructure things. And, and she, she's been super helpful. Um, but I also, I don't think readers always want this like super polished article all the time. Yeah. And not, okay. not saying that it should be sloppy or in that you should cut corners on things, but I think people like an authentic casual. I mean, not, I don't even think casual would be the word, not with like the intent of being casual, but like, oh, this is actually what this person thinks. Okay. Gotcha. Genuine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Okay. Genuine, authentic expression of of their experience, of their relationship with the product. And and that's what we hope our articles convey. Even Patrick, he he has his note to the reader and then he has another article. Um and I and I read them and I'm like, this isn't like a Shakespearean <laughs> work of art as an article, but it's yeah. very authentic. And it doesn't need to be. Uh, yeah, it doesn't yeah. need to be. This is yeah. we're, the we're publisher's note to the a, reader. Pl- yeah, exactly. And he wants to be. This could just be done in a conversation. Yeah. And and it and it feels that way when you read it. Um. And when you're done, you're like, oh, I didn't feel like I was reading some like New York Times article. Yeah. Um. It, it's funny you mention that because I, I, uh, so I I grew up overseas my whole life, um, in Latin America, and um. I went to a college prep school and because of that I was being I'm not <laughs> I'm not a uh I didn't do well right I was a solid C 
Hey, the, uh, you know, the C students. Middle C the... student at best, right? Isn't that who yeah. they say rules the uh, or leads in business? I, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we I, don't hold ourselves to such a high standards where, where we'll actually try new things and, and be happy with the yeah, results. <laughs> man, but like the kind of kids that I went to school with were like, you know, they went to Harvard and Yale and Princeton and, you know, yeah. all from out the world. Right. And they read books like this for, for fun. Right. And I, I was a kid who just wanted to draw in my notebooks and build Legos and stuff, you know, and, and, you know, and go skateboarding and snowboarding and stuff. But, yeah. um, I, where yeah, I'm getting with like that is, uh, is school really ruined the enjoyment of reading for me for a long while. And yeah. it was about four years ago when I, um, I started reading and I had a buddy that challenged me and saying, I just don't think that you're reading the right books because yep. I was despised it. And as soon as I started reading the right stuff that I was actually passionate and enjoyed, I couldn't put them down. And so yeah. now I'm an ad, I'm, I'm, I read books pr probably a whole bunch What's, of week. What type, you know, what, what is it? All different uh, kinds. Of, I, I have this bad habit of like reading like four books at the same time now. Like, so sure. I, <laughs> meaning I, I usually, I, I really into like sci-fi, a lot of stuff yeah. like spaceships and stuff. So I like a lot of that stuff, but then I'm usually doing, reading that alongside a business book and then usually a, a meditation book or something of the sort. Um, all at the same time and depending on my mood. And then I usually have an audiobook when I'm going to. And so yep. I rarely, I think tattooing, um, being in a studio, my last studio, I, I have my own private studio now uh, with oh, my own sweet. private clientele. But before that, I worked in a studio. There were 18 of us in the studio. Yeah. So you were battling for music and it's just shitloads of people. And um, I think after that, all I wanted to do, I didn't want to listen to music after I got done with work all day, you know, for yeah. 12 to 14 hours a day or whatever it might be, uh, tattooing. I just didn't want to listen to music anymore. And so now I'm very much into, uh, books and podcasts. It's basically all I listen to. That's, too, that's what I'm in my studio. Cause I like, like learning that. stuff, you I know, like listen to Jordan Peterson while I'm working out. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. You know what right. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, also love his stuff, but you know, yeah, um, he's a uh, unique, yeah, so unique it, gift to the world. Yeah, so it's also cool that um, now that I enjoy doing it, I I'm also able to uh, enjoy a certain style, different styles of yeah of writing, uh, both poetry, uh, more artistic stuff, and then also just like magazines and just educational stuff that yeah. is straight to the point and i think that's so cool and beautiful when it's done um it's it's really difficult to get which like i commend writers that are able to do this just all the time i don't know how they do it but to have an ex have an experience and then be able to write about it and then get people outside of that experience to get excited about it or like feel some emotion about it um there's there's someone who I, I listen to his podcast really often sean ryan um he was a navy seal cia contractor worked for blackwater did like all his very high level name military ring the bell. I, I think it's, I've it's some of his stuff. fascinating listening to and you have to like commit to it because they range from two hours to like six hours and they're just them like him and his guests sitting in a room and just he will he will let his guests talk until they don't have any more words to say and then they'll stop and he'll be like say more about that and it's almost like he's turned into a therapist okay but not trying to he's just genuinely curious he can relate to a lot of these people because he's bringing in like special forces operators and people who've seen the worst of the world for the last 30 years in their career and and he's able to get these guys to just open up. Um, and, and I don't, that's a podcast that I would encourage everybody to listen to, to just to understand what does the part of society that you don't see every day deal with, specifically because they are the ones that are keeping your lazy boy life stable. 
Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, but I, and but it's funny because you listen to his podcast and you're like, he's not trying. This is not as an insult, but he's not trying to make a show. He's just like wanting to understand what's happening in this person's head, and will dig and dig and dig Authentic until they're just self. If you will. Yeah, yeah, it's and it's like it's shocking what what he's able to to pull out of people on his show um and even, even like some of these special forces guys that after their show comes out he'll sometimes do a recap and be like i've gotten like 500 letters of people who would be dead from their own hand if they didn't listen to this podcast um but for him to be able to pull that out and then convey the emotion of that conversation to his viewers is I think only done because the content itself is authentic and he's not, he doesn't go into it with a mission of like, how do I get more views? How do I do this? It's just, I want to be the vehicle to tell this person's story. Yeah. And that's it. I, I'm and there's no other mission. It's just, I want their story to be heard because I think it will change people and leave it at that i do know who you're talking about now that you mentioned that style because I, I know i know exactly who you're talking about because a, a client of mine was watching it while i was tattooing i have a yeah. tv on the screen and like it introduces me to cool stuff that i don't wasn't yeah. previously exposed to so yeah but he's how we found our, our next cover so ah. too late yeah Oh, a little so, sneak peek in there no okay. no it's not a sneak peek we've already okay. posted about it okay gotcha uh two lamb fascinating fascinating person grew up in vietnam during like the civil war genocide in vietnam when he was a kid his him and his mom and his brother i believe escaped made it to the u.s his mom married an army or a green beret in fayetteville and then that just sucked him into that world so basically since he was like a baby all he's known is combat like just the worst of, of combat and then as a Green Beret, you're at like the tip of the spear, gunfights every night for 20 years. Um I can't and now fathom that, dude. I can't yeah. That, and the way freaking insane. And so the way he talks about it is is um he's not trying I, I don't think uh, he I don't think he's trying to get someone to like feel a certain way by listening to a story i think he's just telling a story and because it's so shocking you're like okay that he's got that pulls that pulls yeah pulls people in um and it was actually my the flight going out to meet the rest of the team in california i listened to his podcast i hit like shuffle on youtube and just pick the top the top pick and that was it and i was like holy crap this guy's story's crazy and so then we we're thinking about who's going to be the next cover it's like hit the way he's it's interesting you mentioned the meditation books his niche and i still it's one of those things that i just don't understand fully um is meditation and he's figured out how to find peace in chaos Mm -hmm. and so he reads books um like the book of five rings by musashi and the art of war yep and he's basically turned his identity into the Ronin character from Book of Five Rings. Um, and so when I approached him, I was like, I want to tell your story. Um, we'd love to come out and interview you, but we don't want it to be the combat stories. Because every people have already heard that. You can just Google him and you get his the whole roster of what he's done in, in the military. But I don't think that's the interesting thing. The more interesting thing is what have you done to stabilize your life and how do you sustain this especially because so many people in his shoes not to be morbid but end up just committing suicide yeah. like or they're just yeah drugs the whole the whole thing which like he went down that road and now he's found peace and is just stable but then he also has his combat training company and 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 he's still very involved in that that scene um, but we said we want to tell your story and I think it would start by just doing a day in the life like how do you function when people aren't watching you 
Um, so he's like, oh yeah, come to my house in Col- in Colorado Springs. Oh, he's and in Colorado. I didn't know that. Colorado, yeah, he's in Colorado. Um, I was like, come to my house, and then we'll just turn cameras on, and I'll go about my day, um, and kind of explain what I'm doing every now and then. But we'll get there at like four in the morning, and he kind of like he said hi, we'd exchange pleasantries, but then he's like, all right, now we're gonna, I'm gonna go meditate for hours outside. We got cameras on four in the morning. It's cold outside. We're just sitting out on his porch watching him do this. And every once in a while, he'd like kind of, I don't know what to call it. He'd break away from meditation and explain kind of what's going through his head and why he's doing what he's doing and then just go right back to it. So, and, and we're just like, this is, I don't know how to explain this. I don't know how to, I'm not sure how we'll write about this because this is an experience that I think you just have to be a part of. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're like, well, let's just film it. So we, we filmed his day and, and then went to the range with him the next day. Um, and that was an experience that I think all of us that were there, there's three of us, were like, I hope we can convey the emotion that came along with it in the video. So we've got, I don't know how many hours of footage we came back with. It was a lot. Yeah. Uh, we're super excited to share that, though. Because it's just this very raw story. Um, and that's where we're like, I think this is the sweet spot of the magazine. Just being able to take someone who maybe they've told the story before, but be able to bring readers to the point where they're feeling something by just the facts about this person's life. Yeah. And what's going through their head. What have they dealt with that you just can't relate to and somehow make it relatable? Especially something that, you know, if he's a pod, you know, him being a podcaster that it, it's not portrayed on his podcast. Like that's a different perspective. That's a really yeah. cool artistic standpoint like how- where you're like, we don't want to do this. That's already been done. Let's take it from this other approach from also a third person point of view. Yeah. Um, out of curiosity, because we were talking about meditation earlier, um, when he was meditating and you said he was gone for, you know, doing it for hours, that's. Yeah. By the way, that's brutal. That's that's insane. Um, meaning, that's really hard to do. Um, yeah. Were all of you guys filming? Were you guys uh, going crazy? Like, uh... no, we we're sitting outside in the dark, just like because the sun hadn't even come up. Like the okay. sun's slowly coming up as we're outside. Um, and we had one person filming the whole time, and then we take pictures every now and then. But it was the conversation in between that was interesting because it wasn't an interview. It wasn't scripted. Nothing we do is scripted. It was just like, what are you doing right now? What's That's going through awesome. your head? I'm very um, much looking forward to that video. So we're very excited for that. It's, it's <laughs> several. So we're very excited for that to be released. When is that um, coming out? Uh, two weeks. Okay. So the week, the 16th, I believe. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and and that's something where like so there was a long uh, segue going back to we have the written story, and I don't think a written story can quite bring you there, regardless of who writes it and how they write it. Um, so this is going to be one where I think watching that footage is going to bring a lot more of that emotion and realism to it. Which to take that to the cigar industry, like I think interviews and in person relationships that we build are going to be what really resonate with people. Because I think like people watch the Joe Rogan podcast, for example, because he sits there and he's just super curious. And I think that's really it. He's not as interesting as he is, he's not that interesting of a person. No, like, and he knows that, and he won't. He knows that he's very. He, he acknowledges very that and accepts that he invites other people who interest him. That's yeah. It, it's it, the whole like philosophy. Of, I'll have a beer with anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's just like, I'm gonna dig into this person's head for a few hours. And Whether he I agrees think we've with been, them or not, which is cool. Yeah, and I think we've been so like been so comfortable with just the instagram reel and and just 
tweets and a quick content where it's like the most exciting piece of something. But that's that's not how life works. That's not how people actually think. So well, I think that's what's so great about podcasts. That's is, what this is. is. It's like yeah, and, and to be very specific with cigars, those things are podcasting and cigars. In my opinion, now I going off on a tangent here. I think there's a lot of cigar podcasts that do it poorly. Yeah. Um, in regard to where. Um, it's basically like watching the c- cigar aficionado, if you will, metaphorically speaking, um, where you just you're bombarded with advertisements five seconds after you started the video, and half uh, half the 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 podcast is advertisements and whatever, yeah. and you're like, dude, whatever. Um, it's like I, it's it's like when we talk to cigar people. It's like I don't I love your cigars, but it's like I don't care that much about the details of your cigar. Yeah, I mean, it's like maybe I shouldn't say that out loud, but it's like that's not the most interesting part of you. Like Nick, the most interesting part of Nick or Matt is not that he makes a good cigar; that's just something he's good at, and that's kind of where it ends. But it's what is what got him there. Yeah, that, and what what you're talking about is, in my opinion, once again, maybe it's just me, but no, is, is art is is this is art, but what makes a painting, for example, or a tattoo. My client today, I was tattooing this morning and um, uh, she was asking me like, do you ever include your client in the piece? Like their personality. I was like, I wouldn't say their personality. That's an interesting I, question. Yeah, I, I, I include their their perspective, their ideas, and I try to collaborate with them. But when it comes to a tattoo, I'm trying to uh, my clients come to me for for me and and if i was trying to be uh kara for example then i'm not going to be a good kara because i don't know kara as well as i know myself and i'm trying to introduce that yeah. and i and yeah. going back to what you're saying is what you're saying is what's interesting about matt and nick is their backstory that is artistic to me and so is no. this and that is what makes it so fascinating to me well no i'm gonna catch you that you said that's why i think i think why is the question that like everybody that's a fan of this stuff actually wants to know it's like why did you do it this way why did you why, why are you the person that you are now what brought you to being able to make this product and then the next step for the more intrigued people is how yeah all i see is in terms of art and in your eye is the same as your palate. There are cigars that I can't stand that other people swear by, man. Like that, just like, I love this cigar and it's highly rated. And going back to books, by the way, um, yeah. when I started reading, um, there are books that I was like, I don't care if it got on the top charts. If it's, yeah. I've stopped because I'm not having to be in school anymore and reading, uh, writing a book report. I don't have to, I don't owe this author a damn thing. Like, like yeah. I don't have to, uh, I don't have to read past a, a, even a chapter if I don't want to, if I'm like, yeah, I'm not jiving. It's cool. And I think the same thing goes for cigars. There are some cigars that I really re- uh, relate to and some cigars that people will swear by. I'm like, meh. <laughs> yep. you know? and, and, and vice versa. And there's probably cigars that you enjoy or, you know, my co-host Ryan really likes a way, he has a way different palette than I do, right? Yeah. He likes pepper bombs in your face, just crazy, yep. you know, uh, my father had that and, 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 you know, stuff like that. I'm like, ah, it's too much. I don't know. You know, yeah. I just, not for me. My favorite cigar that I keep going back to and I've gone back to for years, this guy. What is it? Foundation High Clear. Okay. I have not the had most. That one. White dude, British, smooth. White dude, British, <laughs> just, just that's awesome. Approachable, like it's just it's clean. Um, and I think it, it's like a cigar doesn't always have to challenge your palate. Like just smoke what you like. Time and place too, right? Yeah. Like if we're talking about music, uh, man, I don't want to listen to like I like a lot of different kind of music, almost everything. But I don't want to listen to, you know, some, you know, something light and like in the morning. I want to like I don't want to listen to death metal. Right? You yeah. know what I mean? I want to 
lo-fi or something what have you and then as the day goes on and then at night i want chill again but i want something different throughout if i'm working out i like you like i can't listen to something that's chill i was like i need something like let's go destroy (laughs) you know uh, the uh the akira the don jocko willink album yeah you know who that is uh i know yeah i don't know that album but take make a note akira the don is i don't know anything about the dude that does it jocko no 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 he's just one of let me explain wait say it again a-k-i-r-a the don okay uh i don't know where the guy came from i don't know what he what he does but he'll take every philosopher writer whatever and if there's audio clips somewhere he'll turn them into songs interesting (laughs) and it's i'm intrigued done oddly well so he'll take like like Jocko Willink's good speech where he's where he's talking about how when something bad happens on, on his team when he was in the military, he'd be like, oh, we ran out of ammo? Good. Like, learn how to use something else. Or, mm-hmm. like, every bad thing was, you could flip it and turn it into something good because you can learn something from that. Or... I'll look that up. Uh, it's like people come to me and they're like, I don't know what to do. I can't stop eating sugar. He's like, stop eating sugar. That's what you got to yeah. do. <laughs> It just it's very just I, I saw, just do I, this. Okay. And and this Akira the Don guy will take all of these and turn them into songs. And it's it's hilarious, but they're well done. <laughs> and those are great in the gym. <laughs> I remember watching um because I'm a huge fan of Jocko's too. Um uh I saw on on the the notes, you know, the comments on one of his yeah. videos, it was like, you know, obviously Jocko doing what he does best of just motivating and just yeah, yeah don't stop doing that, right? And uh, someone in the comments was like, how Jocko, uh, hey, Jocko, I um, don't like these hamburgers. So I want to, you know, um, I want a good hamburger. So go and you buy a, a farm and you raise cows and then you go and you make your own damn hamburgers. Yeah. <laughs> That's how Jocko's, you know, mindset is. It's pretty funny. Yeah, so he's, very, uh, um... <laughs> he's great. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, no, I, I, just, I just think all of this is just... Um... People have unique ways of expressing what they're passionate about. Um, and in the cigar industry, it's it seems to be very rooted in history and be rooted in tradition. And then you've got guys like Matt that are like, let's take a different approach. Let's like his whole branding is crazy. It's all, like it's great, but it's like it's so kind of out of left field, just not the traditional Arturo Fuente, my father, like these sort of branding styles. He's an artist. And uh, and so like everything he ball to to the industry. Yeah, and it's this kind of countercultural style. He he's great. So when I when we were talking about the magazine at the at the very beginning, I was like Matt Booth is I, I think going to be the best start. And we weren't thinking of like who's going to get us the most views, who's going to get us the most attention. Um, but it was like he was in the Marines. He has gin, he has cigars, he has jewelry, so he's an artist in many, many different levels. And then he's uh does all the car stuff. Yeah, he's got the the Rumbler Nation. He's like he's got all this the stuff going on. Um, and then you talk to him, he's super authentic. I don't know if you've met him yet. I have not um, met him yet. But it, I'll I'll give him a push to to connect with you and get on your podcast. Um yeah. and I was like, we've interacted in the past on Instagram, um, on my personal Instagram, on my photography page for the past couple of years. He would have every now and then comment just something obscene (laughs) as he does. (laughs) And I was like, all right, he's already broken the inappropriate shell. (laughs) So like, I don't need to be professional at this point. (laughs) So I was like, I'll just send him a message. Like we already have the chat open on Instagram. Um, And then we ended up talking right away. Um, and he's just like super excited to do this. And he's like, yeah, you should come out to LA and come to the jewelry studio. And he's like, now that you're here, I also need some video work done for my company. Can you guys film something while you're here for me? And it, it's just this very open, um, open relationship of 
we're not just here to get our content and ditch. It's mm. we want to help you. And and then we're actually friends with you and we're here not just because we want clicks from your name, but we actually like you. Well, you <laughs> and, and and I think that authenticity from people like him are like, we're just we're excited about you. Yeah. And and we're here. So like what do you what do you need? And a lot of people will approach people and be like, oh, anyway, we can help out. Let let us know. And then you, it ends there. You said it, it er, er, sorry. No, no, you're good. You're good. You said it earlier where where um anything that helps the industry as a whole, which I think from what I understand, reading your magazine, watching your podcasts, watching your guys' videos of you interviewing other people, it seems like the core behind ATF is very much protecting, um, especially when Patrick was interviewing uh the PCA. I, I forgot their their two names. Um um that everything's about the the more we uh help others around in the industry it helps us because it keeps our industry and the thing that we love the most around Mm -hmm. the longest and 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 long in the future right yeah and that's really cool that you say that i i do think that that's uh genuine and and and, uh I, I really respect that to to how your guys's core is because I think that 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 means something. That's not just about scratch my back and give nothing back. Yeah, it, it's that it, the industry specifically is very much an all boats rise approach. Mm-hmm. Other, like I was saying, other industries seem to have trade secrets. They're like, we're going to keep this tight to the vest. We're not going to share what we're doing and how we do this. The cigar industry, it it's like there's not that many unique things companies are doing that make their cigar just amazing and then if it is it's up to the customer to decide if it was if it was good yeah so they can have all these secrets and way they grow ways they grow tobacco and ways they blend at the end of the day it's like do people like it and if they do then great and if they don't then your project failed that being said they're very open with like how did we here's a new way of rolling or let's go back to the like old Cuban style. Like I was talking to Kyle Gellis from Warped when he's talking about the La Colmena. Have you smoked that cigar? I have not. Oh, it's I, phenomenal. I saw your interview. And when, when I like watch like interviews, like with your stuff or any other content, cigar content makers, I'm just like, man, now I got to try that. <laughs> he, Kyle's, hole you go down to. Kyle's really interesting. Um, and I haven't gotten to know him very well, um, but I've liked his stuff since I've gotten into cigars. There's one called, I'm probably pronouncing this wrong, but I think it's the Leo Rojo or La Ro- Lee Rojo, something like that. It's an unbanded stick. And, you know, like you'll smoke a cigar and every once in a while you find one and you're like, what is that smell? Like something's interesting and you can't pinpoint it. And for his, it's like this floral thing going on it's almost almost like it was infused with like some perfume or something but it's not it's just where are his cigars from uh so he i mean he gets tobacco from all over the place but he rolls at and this is what makes it interesting um at uh crap brain fart what's what's the factory called in in miami um it's where willie herrera's family from drew estate is based um El Titan de Bronze. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So I was introduced to them through Brian from Pravada. Okay. Um when he had talked about some of the stuff they're doing, like the Padilla eight and eleven. Um they did the Cohiba Siri M. Yeah. Um they've done some really interesting stuff. And my wife and I were in Miami. First time, I've, only time I've been there, we're like, let's go see Little Havana and then go to Cali Ocho. So like the Havana, Little Havana in Miami. And it's like the ghetto of Miami. It's not. Is it really? I've never been there. Yeah, I've been it's to Miami, kind of a, but I've been there. Little, kind of a sketchy little area. We would run into people and they're like, yeah, don't be here at night. <laughs> mm. um, but you look at it and it's like every building on that street has something to do with cigars. And I'd heard about um this factory and 
for Brian, I took some photos for Pravada of one of the releases they did with this factory. Um, and so we just walk in and it's not a store really. Like they have this little tiny cabinet thing that you can buy some of the stuff they blend for their house label. Um, but there's like five old ladies at tables. The room is tiny. It's like the size of our living room, uh, which is small. <laughs> um, of, of these people rolling ladies, probably like 90 years old, sitting in the corner rolling cigars. And I'm like, is this the factory or, or like to become the right place? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's going on here? Um, and then there's this lady walks up to the front door and she's like, yeah, this is El Titan de Bronze. We make this, this, and this. And they're like, why are you here? <laughs> They're they're inviting and not making it sound yeah, like they're yeah. it was negative. Um, uh, but I was like, I know about you through Pravada and you guys roll warped stuff pretty often. Um and Cohiba and all these different brands. The um what's it called? Herrera Miami from Drew Estate is yeah. rolled there. Okay. Um, but this I yeah. I might be getting this wrong, but it's Willie's sister. And his mom are the ones running this factory. Okay. And yeah. she and she was like, come see our aging room. And I'm expecting to go into like a warehouse or something. But this is like this little shop on the corner of oh, man, how cool. this like residential uh, street. And it's a closet like as big as this. Smaller than what you can see right now. Um, and that's their aging room. And they're so, making stuff for Cohiba and, these, and Drew Estate and these huge brands. But they make one thing at a time. They roll it to perfection. Their family is coming from Cuba. And so they do everything in like super old fashioned style. And and the way Kyle explained it was that specifically the La Colmena, they rolled the way that they used to in Cuba where they do a closed foot and a closed uh, cap. Um, and then they'd get the tobacco wet as they're rolling it. And so because they weren't able to like bank on having a perfect aging room, they would get the thing wet itself. So it would like ferment Introduce and cure it okay. within instead of like the what is it, pilones or whatever they the big bales. Yeah. So so yeah. instead of the the room that it's in being the environment that's gonna cure the cigar, yeah. they're like, we're just gonna make the cigar itself be able to ferment itself. Okay. Um and it's this kind of like musty. It's the it's like the barnyard scent that people talk about that I never could put my finger on what they're talking about and I'm like that's it and it's just this very I, I don't know how to I don't know do how to you, describe it. Do you enjoy the Unique. the barnyard flavor profile? Like when you for that yes. Okay. What do you gravitate towards a certain kind of cigars like your palate specifically? Do you? It depends on the day. Like some days, like like Matt Booth's Namakubi. Have you smoked that? Mm -hmm. It's a powerhouse. It's, <laughs> That's yeah, one, of the, it is. one of the strongest cigars I've smoked. Um, I actually have one in my, I have two in my humidor, actually, that I've those been kind of sitting been, on for a little bit. Because I'm like, all right. It's a... <laughs> they're hard to find. Yeah. Um, like that's phenomenal. But you got to be in, like you said, you got to be in the right mood. But usually I'll go to, like right now I'm smoking the, the LFD Solace. Which is okay. It's a uh, little focus. I haven't had that one either. It just, I think it just came out okay. pretty recently. It's their newest. I think it's their newest. LFD is not a brand that I usually gravitated towards, um, because they've got like the triple Ahero and these really strong cigars. And usually I'm not like, I want to get a punch in the mouth. Yeah. It's like I want to enjoy a cigar. Yeah. Um, but this is like perfect medium, kind of a floral note. Um. And so I think I had a phase where I was like, I want a strong, really flavorful cigar. And then as I've smoked most things that are out, it's like you realize, oh, there's some really unique stuff kind of back towards the middle or the light end. Yeah. Um, one of the cigars that I had that I was like, oh, Connecticut's can be super interesting was the Matt Booth Caldwell collaboration, the tea. Uh-huh. It was like peppery, but really smooth at the same time. Uh -huh. I, I I love that cigar. Um, that one's great. They're hard to find. I don't know if I don't think they're. I mean, they're not making them anymore. I only so. had one. Um, I don't remember when it was, but a while ago. 
but something that I mean, maybe you'll find this as time goes on. The more access you have to cigars, it's like you have to protect yourself against losing the wonder of them. I think, like that kind of, I don't know how to describe. If it's it. not around anymore. No, just like the the it factor of smoking a cigar for you. Like, what is it that you really enjoy when you get to sit down and enjoy a cigar? Okay. Yeah, it's like it's like the more you have access to, especially if they're free, you start to lose kind of the magic of the cigar industry. Um, so like, as you have access to more, it's like focus on finding stuff that's, that's unique, that has a cool story that really fits that flavor profile you enjoy. And lately it's been like, what can someone do with a light cigar? Mm. That's interesting. You know, that's contrary, especially nowadays, man, it seems like everyone's about Maduro and I want this like punch in the face. Kind of, yeah. you know, I mean, all the podcasts, the cigar podcasts I find is just like, they want this oomph to it. Right. Yeah. And, and, and even so, um, like my co-host Ryan, like he's super into pepper and, and he's super into, uh, I think more accurately, he's super into like almost all he drinks. If, if it were up to him, all he would drink is like triple IPAs. Right. So uh, everything is Colorado it, people. <laughs> yeah yeah everything is like a, a, a swift kick in the pants right like, yeah look man i like ipas i i started with yeah. ipas um i, I didn't There's start some great ones until late in my life um and but how old are you by the way I, I i'm 37 okay so but i didn't start drinking until i was 26 i was okay. a, a, a christian boy that uh, you know teetotalist you know yeah so um i know yeah yeah Yeah. so um i i didn't do that i didn't participate until later on in my life and like i I think i got into ipas like oh that's good but then i realized the subtleties of even even a lighter beer right like hey man you know and and uh introducing my co-host like ryan into into coffees and like you know, and, uh, and other subtleties in between everything. And uh, it doesn't have to be just in your face all the time, right? Especially it's, it's when you have the ability to have that thing more often, you don't feel the pressure to like make this one count. Yeah. And, and mind you, we're extremely spoiled. I'm so spoiled with beer that it's, it's insane. The point where I go, like my best friend lives in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm like, you guys don't have crap for beer down here. Like it's awful. Like you go to a restaurant, it's like strawberry cheesecake, something rather. Like this is so I will send you you talking about. I will make some crazy label for it because it's not legal, but I don't care. Uh, I'll send you Wisconsin's, uh, gem of beer spotted cow okay. from new glarus okay it's just it's blue moonish but it's Ooh, but yeah. it's but it's ours <laughs> and it's so it's so really good <laughs> there's a thing to be so I, I mean if we're talking about like less quality beer like not like micro brews yep. if you will um I mean, man like i love honestly I love like a Modelo Negra or a Corona or something like that. Like, I, I really like that. Um, it's not my go-to, but on a hot day on something, right? It, it's, we were talking about music before. It's a time and a place. There's something to be said. You know, I've really been in a trying to learn about like pairings and stuff like that. And just making attempt, a, a, a little bit of thought into placing and like not every cigar is going to go with the triple IPA, you know, yeah. or, or, um, and, and vice versa, or a, uh, once I, I, I'm a big whiskey guy. So, um, you know, not everything's going to be a, what is that? That's the Willet oh, for your, had that oh, one either. really? What is that? Oh, then you're not a big whiskey guy. I caught you. Apparently. <laughs> no, I haven't had that. Well, hold on. We'll is get into that in a second. It's a rye. We'll get we'll get into this in a second. But continue continue. Yeah. Meaning meaning there's certain cigars that pair well with a bourbon, that compare with a scotch, with a compare with an Isla, um, that you know, that is with a beer. And um I think that's that's totally 
um, totally okay. And, and, and I've even had like other podcasts and stuff that have, that I've, okay, I want to try a specific cigar, but they recommend like a rum. Yep. I don't know much about rum, but, yeah, I don't either. um, you know, but Diplomatico is the only holy one. Shit, I'm like, like, I want to, I want to try that now, you know? Um, have you had Diplomatico? Uh, not Diplomatico, no. Get that. Okay. That's great with a cigar. It's like the perfect sipping rum, and you can find it in most places. Okay. That's all I know about rum. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I'm, I'm a big Scotch guy. Um, yep. I've only the past past year i've been getting into more like bourbon and stuff um i think i i got introduced by my uh, really good friend but to like mccallan to highland yeah. scotches so i know most about scotches and then other stuff i'm starting to learn more and more about the idea of uh, okay there's other things that exist yeah, we're the we're the opposite um, in that okay and, and, and rye and rye i know the least amount um about um, I, I'd say my my drink of choice, my cocktail of choice. If I if I really have a choice, I'm I'm asking for a Manhattan. And, okay. Um, contrary to tradition, which is made with rye whiskey, um, I always make my Manhattans with with bourbon. Um, okay. That's like kind of blasphemous, uh, but it's how you like it. That's, that's just, what matters. Man, oh man, the sweetness and everything with the port. My the, my cocktail of choice is a Negroni with gin. Mm. And I, I can't I can't break that. It's that's like if I'm going to like a nicer place and I know they actually know what that is, <laughs> which in like small town Wisconsin, that's rare. Okay, okay. <laughs> I've just recently started dabbling, dipping my toes into gin. Um, it's more it's floral, a, right? It's more. Uh, I'm not yeah. used to tasting those flavor notes that are on a on a, on a scotch specifically. The room, the room 101 gin. It's I haven't had his gin either. I I gave him so much crap right away because I was like, the I think the weekend before we went out to film with him, I I had one of the worst gins I've ever had. I won't say the name of of where it's from, but I it's this little distillery near here, and like this mom pop place and i'm like oh cool they make whiskey and gin and whatever I'm like this is just bad and you would taste it and you'd get nauseous Ugh. like physically nauseous and i'm like something's wrong here and i start googling like what would cause you to just be nauseous from a sip of gin yeah and everything's like your body has the ability to more or less identify when something's poison and try to like eject it oh <laughs> <And I'm> like <laughs> So from what I understand, they're getting some like gener- or like neutral grain spirit from somewhere and then infusing it with whatever they're infusing it with and calling it gin and then putting their name on it, which is a bad idea. Yeah. And so I was like, but they but they described it as citrus forward, lemon peel, uh navy proof, so like the barrel strength. Um and so then we like the that next week we go out to see Matt and he's talking about his gin. And he said it was navy proof and, and like lemon peel and citrus forward. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> like I'm a sucker for for like Hendrix. That's I I love okay. Hendrix or, or Monkey 47. Um and I was like, I like you, I like your cigars, but I will not be biased in rating your cigar or your gin and telling you if it sucks. <laughs> what you, what's your opinion on uh is it blue tail? Blue, blue? I don't think I've had blue tail whale tail it's oh, got a whale oh, tail on it yeah yeah i just had just, it last week it was the first I just time had i ever it, had it i just had it the other day um, um being a gin guy because i'm not um I, I was actually like okay okay no that's a unique one um that's a really unique one that's kind of uh, like a peppery finish yeah and it wasn't um uh i i found in the gins that i've had it's very uh um what's the, the i mean can't even think of like the thing that um not black licorice but the the the, the juniper the juniper thank you yeah the juniper it's very juniper forward um which a, a lot of i've had some some gins that i'm just like whoa holy I, crap have you That's, have you had hendrix no i have not i I've okay only had so a i would recommend full gins so i'd recommend having a cigar like this 
like a, something like with Hendrix, with maybe Hendrix, an ice yeah. cube or maybe like an ice cube or two. Straight. Um, just straight. Okay. And that's that's not common. Okay. But it, it, it like really opens up a cigar, I think. And gin is not traditionally uh, something you'd pair with a cigar. And and so Nick Malillo actually is the one that was like, you should try this and this together because his the high clear project he did was um, with high clear castle in England. Um, and it was they said we wanted to I'm going to get the history wrong, but I, one of the kings from like the 16, 17, 1800s was super big into Cuban cigars and gin. And so he would have cigars created and sent to this castle. That castle is where Downton Abbey is filmed. Okay. Um, and it's just rich with history. That's why he's super into this Egyptian history now with King Tut because okay. the family that owns that castle is the family that discovered King Tut's tomb. And so they're like, now that we have this history all baked into this castle, let's just lean into it. And so like the new High Claire release is it comes on a box that looks like the coffin that they found King okay. Tut in. That's cool. Yeah. Just from a... <laughs> he, like, he, he, he nerded out point. on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so um, gin, though. He's like, gin is traditionally, especially with that like lighter Cuban style mm. cigar, was the pairing they had in England when this type of cigar was really brought to the market and popularized. So he's like, technically, if you want to get specific that was kind of the drink of choice um so there's something there okay um and then hendrix is like a very british uh london dry style um but the really juniper down, with a, with that. a yeah so the juniper with a lighter cigar just kind of adds like that floral note that people are kind of going after with lighter cigars yeah it, it accentuates it and but to bring this back to matt booth's i was like your gin might suck and i will tell you if it does uh he nailed it like really but that's that's interesting man yeah there's so many unique pairings that people don't think about because it like you said like with ryan it's like you gotta have the strongest thing with the strongest thing i'm just, I just that can be great like not discounting absolutely that. um but I, I don't think that should always be the pursuit of like how much can i challenge myself here <laughs> <laughs> it's There's just t- times where I, like i don't want my mouth to be on fire with pepper and nicotine it is not i, I want to actually enjoy my yeah. experience you know um, what are, what are you drinking um so i started with a uh, talisker storm oh yeah which i, I just got a bottle of that okay yeah it's a great it's a great um it's not super overly peated mm-hmm. um which i think paired really well and I ran out. <laughs> um, we drink a lot on the podcast um, when we're drinking a little bit. Yeah. So then I switched good to. Thing. So then I switched to uh, Laws uh, Bourbon. Okay, I've never heard of that one. And so this is a Colorado-based one. So all the four grains are made in Colorado. Um, Very cool. And and that's a good one. Um, I really enjoyed this one as well. Um, like I said, if I'm gonna pick an American whiskey. Um, I tend to gravitate towards bourbon, which is weird because I don't have a, I don't have a sweet tooth, which most bourbons tend to be, you know, sweeter than the rye. So, yeah, I I mean, I'm super into, um, anything that enhances a cigar. Obviously I think being a cigar guy, first and foremost, I want the cigar to be the star of the show. Yeah. Um, and anything i'm super in growing up with my background living overseas my whole life like i i um i'm very open to other experiences that i wasn't previously exposed to before right so like oh i have never tried that because i i didn't really have the choice of sticking to something that uh i'm comfortable with um, yeah. and, and I think that that translates to alcohol and, and something that pairs well is, oh, okay. And sometimes you won't always get it right. In my opinion, I don't always get it right. Like, eh. or even in my opinion, I've 
looked up certain cigars on their website, they say, we recommend pairing it with X, Y, and Z. And oh, you're like, mm -mm, nope, yep. I, can't, I can't taste the cigar or what have you. I feel like a lot of times that's like some brand agreement they came up with, like, like the like Drew State just did their blackened, the M eighty one. Um, it's a great cigar. It's real heavy. It's real peppery, but then it has the big blackened whiskey label on it. Yep. So it's like I've okay, it. you're supposed to you're supposed to pair this with blackened. It's like it's just whiskey. <laughs> it's like well, I also it's whiskey that... that met Metallica. <laughs> Well, it, I it's also, good, but it's not I, groundbreaking. And I personally thought that blackened tastes like peanut butter. Like I got like oh, a interesting. Peanut, peanut buttery taste from what I I had it once. And I was like, mm, uh, this isn't this isn't. So the me. only the only blackened I had, which will lead into the next thing, was I believe the Willet six year rye or bourbon. They have different uh, kinds. I didn't know they had different kinds. Yeah, so they'll do these. Oh. They'll do these uh, small batch projects and then age just... it in their distillery, which they'll like blast Metallica in in the aging room. What a weird um, concept, huh? And that was like a phenomenal, phenomenal whiskey. Hmm. Um, but will it? So that's okay. It's empty now. So oh, okay. I've moved. Okay. I've moved to finer things. <laughs> Miller <laughs> High Life. It's yeah. so good. It, I've recently decided that I've loved Miller High Life. Okay. Um, Will it fascinates me. Um, if they haven't, we have an article about them in the next issue. This is not a plug for the next issue. Um, I went there a couple months ago, did the whole bourbon trail thing again, and and I've got some friends that are just super into collecting whiskey just to an obsessive degree okay um and will it's one of those things where people will go after these family estate bottles so will it has like noah's mill um and rowan's creek and some other some other lines under the will it name mm. um but the family estate so whenever you see this crest okay uh and then the top is either purple or green it looks very wine like it does yeah i mean it's a wine bottle basically and yep it wine is the best is it is the best whiskey just of anything that i've had and so the the family estate i don't know how available it is i'd imagine that whiskey store that or that, that liquor mm -hmm. shop that's I'm... near you they'd have something from them um i'd say anything under the willet name is going to be great um but so they started, it's like a, it's an old distillery from, I believe the 1800s and they've been sold and reacquired and sold and, and purchased again over time. But the family now, they got really good at curating barrels. So they'd find barrels and then age them in their warehouse. Okay. And then they'd decide like, okay, what's the next rye that we're going to release for the four year, three year, and and they you, they used to have a three year. Now it's just four year, um, which is their green top. Green is rye, purple's bourbon. Okay. Um, but they've done like an expert job at picking barrels, so they'll find other people's product, age them for I don't know what the amount of time it takes to claim it as your own. Um, but you have to be in control of the barrel for a certain amount of time, and then you can put your label on it. Yeah. Um. So it's, uh, I don't, I don't even know if they're single barrel, but they're all cast cask strength aged in their warehouses, and after I believe the nine year, and back so nine I think it goes up to like fourteen, fifteen somewhere in there. Um, it's just barrels that they've curated, and they're super expensive. They're like three grand a bottle. Once you get into like the purple, the purple top ones that have been oh aged for past God. nine years. Um, but the four year, so the four year they continue to make, and I don't think it's going to last that much longer just based off the way they've structured. Um, it's barrel proof, so it's real full. And this will, this will get back to cigars. Um, it's what is the proof on this one? It's 53%. 
um, 107 proof. And it is just, it, it kind of fills every gap of your taste buds, mm. which. Where are they from? Uh, they're in Lexington or uh, Bardstown, Kentucky. Okay. And it's funny because Heaven Hill was put where they are now because it was like the highest point where bourbon in Kentucky was distilled. Yeah. And then Willett put their distillery on the hill next door, which was higher. <laughs> and so you go, to, you go to the distillery and you're looking down at Heaven Hill. And, you know, being from Colorado, you're talking about high. We're talking about like... I mean, Kentucky is just hills, but like... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but the experience they have there, they have the bar at Willett. Um, so you, you pay for the tour and then you can go up to the second floor bar. But it's like they're not they're not trying that hard which is which is interesting to see because it's become like the whiskey snobs gold mine of like if you can get the older purple tops you've struck gold it's kind of like pappy okay where it's just like the thing yeah um but they're just doing something right and it has that like floral note i'm gonna try it i wrote down super smooth will it for your i think that's going to be the most accessible one you can find have you had the bourbon yeah okay. yeah oh, and the bourbon's good as well yeah but okay. noah's mill or rowan's creek are there they're two bourbons that aren't the family estate crest bottles okay um and i think they're i wouldn't say they're just as good but they're real close and you can tell it's like the same product aged at different different lengths um and it's phenomenal mm. and okay and so there's companies like this that are like we want to focus on filling your palate regardless of whether it's like the super heavy super high proof product okay and i think with cigars it's stuff like this where it's it's a light cigar the connecticut wrapper but it's a nicaraguan filler and so someone who's like oh i'm new to cigars they'd probably gravitate towards the lighter wrapper right yeah yeah but you've <clears throat> probably experienced that that's not always the smoothest cigar correct because sometimes the lighter means it's aged less, so it's probably going to actually be stronger, more more nicotine, more pepper, whatever it might come with. Um, and I think I'm going to keep harping on your uh, your co-host Ryan. Where <laughs> that's okay, he's not here. He's sick. So he's not here, so we can, this, we can, we can he can just of. take the abuse, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, but he's I going to watch this he, and laugh. I think what he and others are pursuing our full flavor not necessarily like power behind it and you can get to that point where it's not super peppery it's not offensive to your palate but it's um it checks every box i would even say that you can get a i've had kinetic scars that are very very flavorful Mm -hmm. that aren't a kick in your pants right um uh so uh, part of it is accessibility, but I mean, man, I, I really like like Perdomo, right? Perdomo does an exquisite job at, you know, having like Connecticut packs, but they have like yeah. the Lot 23, the Champagne edition, right? For example. And I have yet to give well, one of those- Champagne is cig- phenomenal. But dude, I have yet to give one of those cigars to a noob and they don't. They're like, this is amazing. Yeah. Because it's not a boring Connecticut, right? I have had boring boring Connecticut's that you're just like, I I feel like I'm sucking through a straw, right? But but like a Perdomo, I have not had a boring, you know, being from Nicaragua, it's not a boring cigar. And and the champagne is, I mean, is just a very well done Connecticut to where it's got enough interest it's got enough pizzazz if you will <laughs> and, I th- and i think that's what people want and so like when when i got into bourbon i think the hey josh um hey josh i think, I think <laughs> he's the manager here he's great nice uh the bourbon for me especially if it's not barrel proof has been one of those that's like it's missing something in a, in a, where it's okay. like it, it doesn't quite fill your palate like you want it to 
And I think that's because I've now spoiled myself with like, if I'm going to buy a bottle and spend a decent amount of money on it, it's going to be barrel proof because that's like the raw expression of what that distillery was trying to do. And, and I think it's like you said, with like the Perdomo champagne, where it's, it checks the boxes you're looking for. It fills the palate. You're not looking for something more. You're like, that was, that's what I wanted in a cigar. And it doesn't really have anything to do with like the pepper and the spice. It's just full body. And I think construction is number one with cigars. Um, I was, I just did a, I need to release it. <laughs> I've delayed it because things got, things got busy. Um, uh, but with John, I'm going to butch his last name. It's like Lon, Londrani or Londrini um, from Peter James. You're familiar with Peter James? Hold on. Again, my case here. I oh, have you, got, an you have OG one. Peter James back when they first came out. I have yet to see one in person. So this to the point where look, look at this, gotten. man. It's like worn and do you know John? I, I don't know John, but right, I saw his stuff you. and my wife bought me this for I think it was Christmas. Okay, like, your wife spoiled you. Like, I mean, very early on to where, but this is like, now they have fancy Peter James. Mine doesn't even have like the, here, mine looks like a. Like, I love uh, that though. Know? That's like the authentic, just. But, but I wish, you know, there's this things, you use any product and you're like, oh man, I want this. So I, I wish I could put cigars in this and it would not be crushed crush my cigars right yeah but like i mean now um, they're now they're certified by Boveda and yeah yeah now they, they have like hard the cases but this is like the og this is like oh, that's awesome this, this is the first model they came out with that like everything's soft right so but if i put cigars in here it's getting smushed <laughs> right um, that's awesome though i like that and uh i actually uh i had a post by them sorry not to make it about me but i no, good. posted about I, I took a photo with this and uh peter james actually commented on their instagram i tagged him and they were like oh man that's og peter james i'm like yeah so he's your first one he's so passionate about the industry and the experience um and that interview which i was telling him i'm like i think we need to we need to edit this or do something because it was so like unprofessional because it was <laughs> it's so many technical issues and and it was just this very raw no plan no real podcast format it was like but i liked it because i got to know i got to know him i got to know the passion behind the brand like what is he actually trying to deliver to customers um and and they're releasing or they have cigars now and so do they really uh, yeah and so i was like what is, is your own cigars now what yeah yeah, I even have them on Instagram. I didn't even know that. And and so I was like, "What is your, what do you call a good cigar if you're making one?" And, and because the leather products you make are so high quality, we're like, people are probably going to expect this like Louis Vuitton level of a cigar, which isn't the thing. So it's like, what? How are you going to bridge the gap of of representing your brand? in leather products in cigars and bags and, and all the other things we do in coffee perfume furniture <laughs> like they're all over now um and he said construction he just kept saying construction and he's like end of the day tasting a cigar is a subjective experience you don't have to enjoy it uh or not not everybody will enjoy the same thing that i enjoy um but if you at least deliver something that is at least meeting industry standards of what the construction of this product is supposed to be, people will at least accept it as being quality. And they'll start there. And then as they get to know the product or as they expand their palate, they'll find other reasons that they enjoy this. But construction is what at least gets you into the game. So when okay. he's blending, he's like, construction of our cigars is the most important thing and if someone picks up a cigar and it draws like shit they'll write it off real fast um, so so he's like construction is paramount everything okay. else is subjective so i'm going to blend cigars that i like but i'm going to construct them to perfection 
And if you decide that you like them, then it's a win. And if not, you at least know that we put our our effort into constructing a Two cigar. Forward. Yeah. Correctly. And, and and that's where I think cigars that you have that are like, hey, I could do without this. It's like sucking hot air. Yeah. Usually if you break it down, it's just the Man. construction was bad. Usually. Not bad, but like maybe it's a little bit loose or tight draw. Yeah. Or just something's missing. And it's usually not related to the flavor. It's usually related to the construction. Yeah. So I have a buddy of mine who smokes. We could be smoking the same cigar. And now we're talking about smoking um, along what you're saying with like, okay, you can roll a cigar a certain way and the construction can be well well made um yeah. but even the, then the cigar smoker can have certain habits that also um inhibit the sure. quality of what we're doing and i have a buddy who i love dearly um but we'll be smoking the same cigar and mine will look like pristine fine like no problem but his will look like a wily coyote cartoon right like, it'll just yeah. be like and then you're like how upon... are you okay with this yeah like dude <laughs> what are you doing that i'm not doing like what the fuck is going on here you know like this is insane what we're smoking the same cigar we got from the same place we're at a cigar lounge and yours looks like the end of a rosebud coming across yeah. versus where mine is you know where it's uh it, it... now and and that goes to smoking style right yeah. like how i could get how you light it how you we, keep relighting it yeah we could be sitting right next to each other right now i could be where you're at and i could give you my cigar this cigar right now and you could take a draw off of this and you would never know that it was ever lit because i mean i don't slobber all over mine but i know some people that do right yeah, like, me neither. But, i can't do that but everyone's different, right? Some people kind of chew on it a little bit and that's, that's just interesting. And just actually, interesting. Well, well, actually this, this, those is, people it, are just interesting. So, so, so this actually kind of um, naturally uh, concludes to something that I want to ask you. So um, I personally believe that um, you buy a cigar, like you go to a cigar lounge, you buy a cigar, that's your yeah. cigar. You paid the money for it. You can smoke it however you want. You want to smoke that thing backwards? Have at it, man. However, there will be people who are silently judging you from the corner, right? Yeah. Do you have Do you have a cigar smoking pet peeve, if you will? Like, if you're in the lounge where you're at right now and you were to witness something, is there something that tilts you of sorts that that uh, okay you may not say something but big ring gauge okay someone that's trying to prove something or what it's a good question big big ring gauge like not like 60 i mean 60 is really pushing it for me um when people are like i gotta make this cigar count so i'm gonna get the biggest one i can find and i know companies like uh asylum just do crazy things flathead. With, with size flathead i have a couple um, flatheads in my humidor that yeah give or they just that or like, like the femur from um romacraft and like there there's a place for them i guess and i think part of it is america likes things big and that we like value um but i i don't understand the advantage okay to picking the biggest cigar you can find and i think there's something to be said about how the uk has selected cuban cigars that have really taken off there and they're all coronas like real small or or lanceros and that's getting to this into the cigar snob thing of like the ratio of filler to yeah. wrapper um but um I've never heard that answer before. And that and it's not a pet okay. peeve. It's just uh so maybe I'm answering your question correctly, but I've never understood that. It's like the same cigar you're smoking is made in this size and it's so much better. Yeah. Because yeah. you want something to last longer and you want it to be bigger. 
you pick this. I'm like, ah, oh, come on. There's a better there's a better so, version of this. Like, um, but I would be completely satisfied if every company went back to making Coronas and just left it at that. Because because I, I think that's like a Corona or a Lancero, but I think Corona specifically because you don't have to commit hours to it. Um, it's just the perfect it's the perfect size. It, so it gives you like 45 minutes. Yep. It, it it's not locking you into saying I'm gonna smoke this cigar for the next two hours. Um you don't feel like you're trying to shove something into your mouth. It's yeah, just yeah. like yeah. that you don't and, your and jaw you, doesn't hurt afterwards. But right? then you look at the <laughs> like the history of cigars of what was popularized in Cuba and as as bad as Cuba went. <laughs> Politically, it's like they they really kind of created the cigar culture and and trade. Um, they set the bar for yeah. what cigar should be. Um, and it wasn't what can you prove to the people around you that you're smoking. It's how can we create something that you can enjoy the most for the lot in the way that it, and in the way that it, that the creators intended and blended and so like to take it back to kyle gellis from warped um i don't i might be wrong but i think everything he creates he only releases one size because he's like i blended this to be this size and that's how it's supposed to taste that's how it's supposed to be presented he doesn't do big ring gauge um most of them are shorter um he's got a couple um like lonsdale lancero kind of sizes um but like he so you took the time to figure out what is the best expression of this blend and left it there. This is the like way you, I made it to be. You don't have, and it's like, you don't have to like it. And I'm yeah. not making this to sell a billion of them. It's just, and especially the way he has them rolled at this small factory. He's like, they can only make so many. So when they make something, they're going to make it slowly. Kind of that old style before Cuba was a communist mess where volume was the focus yeah we're like we're we're making quality and we're gonna leave it there and we hope you enjoy it mm -hmm. um but we believe that this is the best expression of this work of art and mm -hmm. and that like that's like will it distillery they don't make that much of this family estate line and when you can find it like there are people who have 50 100 bottles of this minimum 100 dollar bottle because and they know that it's from a different batch or from a different barrel because it has a slightly different proof. It's like 0.2% off from the one they bought last week. But yeah. they're like, they're like, what else does Willet think we should try? Um, and and Willet looks at it like this is the next expression of what we've created, and we think it represents the original um, vision of what we had for this product. And every time we release something new or release a new barrel out of our our warehouse, we wanted to represent the original plan of what we had for yeah. this product. Yeah, and that like I think that's something to be respected because they're they're not focused on volume of sales. It's we don't care how much we sell, but this is what we're selling. Yeah, and, yeah. and they know very specific reasons as to why. And we intended it to be X, Y, and Z, right? yeah uh, the the so if we're talking about size for example so um i am not a huge fan of lanceros now i used to be a member of pravada um huh, i, I kind of i've been dabbling <laughs> about um however and i know that brian is a very lancero guy however he's in florida lanceros smoke like garbage here in Colorado, complete. Yeah, you, gotta in, you gotta be in a lounge. Come, no, no, it's just it's just altitude. Oh, that's true. Smoke, yeah, smoke like garbage. And if you ever care to listen to like a podcast I had with Travis, is I, did, I um, was no, yeah. Um, he, I mean, it's it's all oxygen, right? It's um, it just it smokes like shit. Like yep. it just doesn't. You set a Lancero down here in Colorado. For five minutes, if you don't take a draw off that cigar, it's done. I mean, yeah. you have to light it 20 times 
I mean, it's, it's crazy. If you're doing what we're doing right now, where we're talking, it's just, it's gone. And you have to light that thing. I mean, I'm, I'm not exaggerating 20 times. Um, I'm, I'm a huge fan. Of, I'm going to smoke a smoke a Lancero next time in Den- I'm in Denver. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, let's do it together. Um, let's do it. I mean, I mean, well, it, it just, it smokes differently. Um, my parents live in North Carolina, so pretty much sea level. Yeah. I can lay a cigar down there, set it down, and come back to it 30 minutes later and it's still lit. Yeah. Crazy. Um, here in Colorado, it doesn't happen. So you have to have a little bit of a tighter draw and you have to have a um, uh, a bit of a thicker ring gauge from what I've noticed just to keep the ash on there to keep a little bit of insulator to keep it lit. Um, I really like robust, robustos, um, uh, or have you had thicker. the Illusione Rothschild? Yes, great that cigar. Your, it might be your cigar in Colorado. Um, it's yeah, it's like meaty enough that it's not gonna crack if it's cold out or if it's dry. Yep. I don't know how I found that, but that's one of my favorites. Like I haven't had one in a long time. I need to, I need to get some. Um, that was always one that I'm like, if I'm going to go on like a walk in the winter and smoke a cigar, that's it. Okay. And it'll, and it'll last and it'll stay lit. Okay. But I've been going back to like the Peter James thing. It's constructed perfectly. I mean, there's something and, to be and, said about something that just stays the way it, it stays together. Yeah. Because I don't know about you, but if I smoke a cigar and it's unraveling with me, that is the most annoying Thing. so what's what's your pet peeve in a um, lounge bring it back to lounges okay um i understand okay i'm gonna preface with i understand why it happens because it's a specific kind of people but it's coming from cig- cigarette smokers but it's when people i mean dive bomb the the, the cigar in, and just grind it into the ashtray that's yep. my biggest pet peeve you're just like dude just let it just let it die in peace, man. Like, yeah. I don't know if that's coming from the artistic point of view to where I feel that, um, you know, there's been 200 hands that have dealt with this tobacco that have done with it. And I do appreciate it almost like a, a, a ritual, if you will, yeah. um, yep. to where just let it, just let it go, man. Don't let it, don't cram it into oblivion. That, that no. to me, I think is the biggest uh, thing. I see that most in Colorado. Um, when I'm at lounges, you'll just see, and I don't mean to be judgy, but like it, it signifies someone who doesn't, ha- hasn't really smoked a whole lot uh, of cigars, yeah. right? And they're a cigarette smoker who they cram it and they just smush it in it. you know, it's, it's, uh, Someone who who has spent so much time making this thing that is a beautiful thing, and here I sound hippity dippity, but no, it's, and it's then what, you just that's what it is. Yeah, you just smash it is crazy. So it's like think about the person that made it sitting next to you. Yeah, and smoke it, smoke it that way. I've never thought about that way, but yeah, that makes sense. It's it's just it just yeah, that bums me out. <laughs> I don't yeah. say anything, but. I'm silently in the corner judging them, <laughs> right? Where it's like, cool oh about, man, it's been cool about this lounge specifically. I think I'm. I might be wrong, but I think I'm the youngest person that's been consistently here since I started coming here. Because hmm. um, we're in the Lake Country area in Delafield, which is like, I like guess like where the money is in the state. Not like inner city money, but like old money everybody owns their own business mm. um and if i'm here during the day specifically it's pretty much this kind of the same group of older guys but like that's their social group and matt the owner i, I don't know if it's that the way he's curated the selection in, in the humidor or the staff or the environment whatever it is it, they've curated where like you come in here and you can't not appreciate the product mm. and have some sort of respect for the product. Um, and so people are, 
like maybe it's a problem, but I don't think it is because they're they're always busy. Um, but it's not as much the place where people are walking in off the street just to grab a cigar and try something. It's like people come here because they know they love cigars. And so we're kind of spoiled where it's like people know etiquette, but not in a pretentious way. And the etiquette is driven by an appreciation for the art and for the ritual of smoking a cigar and the camaraderie it brings. Um, we don't see a lot of that, but then you go to like an inner city lounge and it's just also, we're not, a, it's not a bar here. We have a cooler with beer and that's it. Mm. And they close at eight, which it's eight. It's almost nine. <laughs> uh, so they close whenever people leave. That's kind of how okay. it works. Okay. Uh, but it's not marketed as like we're open really late and we've got a bunch of like stuff that'll get you trashed quick. Um, and so it's just this like kind of this clean expression of what a lounge should be, I yeah. think. And this, this is a very biased opinion of it, but I, but I believe that's what that's what it is. Um, and I think that needs to happen in more lounges, um, because there's I think a respect that companies that make these products deserve, <clears throat> and especially when you have events, when the people who make the cigars come in. And they see their products being treated with respect. Mm. That builds such a deeper relationship. Yeah. So they've with... spent time to develop, right? Yeah. And then Great. they look around the shop and there's people enjoying their product at an event because they know about the company. They know how it how it ended up in their hand. And, and I think that's something that like, especially if you go to a gas station and buy a cigar or something, or you're in like a casino in Vegas and people don't <laughs> care what they're smoking. They're like... Mm. I want to be drunk and I want to be smoking something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like, I just want to get to somewhere. Um, here, it's like I've had some of the most authentic conversations I've had with people. Um, it was at a, a shop in, in Madison last night, tasting room. They're in another phenomenal lounge. And they've like just curated this perfect environment. And theirs is a lot more high class, but it's, it's just how do we bring people in that love the product, love the environment that it kind of brings with it, um, and then all the auxiliary products like whiskey and, and things like that to pair with, um, and you end up with just this group of people that's understanding of what it actually took to be able for them to leave work on a Friday night and then go and enjoy this. And, and I think that's something that's generally been lost in society with most things. Mm -hmm. and cigars it seems to have still held on it, cigars has this thing to where as we were saying earlier it's like the, it's the one thing that slows you down time yeah you know it, it, it you make a commitment to just slowing down stopping cost enough to like just take your time with it and and enjoying other people's company and you guys have, I, I've watched a lot of your guys' podcasts and talking about it, you personally as well, you interviewing the other people is, it's just, it's a thing to where it makes you stop. You just yeah. take your time and have conversations and sit by some random other guy that you were saying earlier, that you're probably one of the youngest guys there that's been there consistently. Yeah. Odds are, myself included, I, uh, you know, odds are that there are people majority of the time they're older than i you know yep. and and uh that we get to have a conversation that usually we wouldn't have something to talk about before yeah and that's so cool and then appreciating what what we're what we're smoking and not only the time that it takes but also the 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 art, artistry that that goes behind um appreciating what it is we're, we're smoking and yeah. and camaraderie if you will <laughs> Do you feel optimistic about the future of our industry or do you feel like with all the litigations of like them trying to like, you know, take tobacco yeah. away from us, do you feel optimistic or, or what's your take on that? There's been some big wins with the PCA in regards to them and the Cigar Rights of America, the CRA, um, fighting against legislation against tobacco mm -hmm. 
So the biggest thing has been, like, we've gotten to know Josh Roberski and Glenn Loop from the PCA. Mm-hmm. Josh is, like, their lobbyist, their powerhouse he, guy. He guys had the interview with, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then now they've uh, submitted articles for the last two issues. And it's kind of like this tone of where are we now? Because it's never like a we did it. It's just where are we now? And what's the next thing to combat in in the legislation side of things? Um, and they the the biggest win I think so far has been the division of separating cigarettes from tobacco or from cigars. Uh huh. And they finally did it. So now the FDA has finally acknowledged that they're different. And so the legislation against them and the marketing and all of that has to be separate. But just like the FDA will grab on to anything that they can to to bring an example of why tobacco should be shut down in court. And it doesn't take much. And and so if there's things that cigar brands can do to stay out of the aim of the FDA to keep the entire industry moving forward, they should be doing that. And I'm not saying that people should just bend over for whatever the government wants them to do all the time. But if we don't want to become like France or like Canada, where you can't even have the original band on a cigar and you can't sell them in the box, or it's just like a black and white label with a name on it, which I think is just like an adulteration of the original branding of cigars. There's a, I can't remember the name of the podcast or the name of the guy, but he's one of the guys that got really into this slow smoking competition in okay croatia okay um but he's from new york but i did a podcast with this guy in england who his his story was basically he when he was a kid he got really into art and he would curate collections of um art over time and what he found the most fascinating was cigar labels and when cigars really got traction and brands that we know like monte cristo and and there's these old brands that go way back into like cuban history um started it they were marketed to an, an overly illiterate society so they had to market their product specifically by the artwork that was connected to them and so you'd walk past a cigar shop and see in the window the super ornate artwork and that's what drew you to the product if you strip that away then it's just a rolled up tube of tobacco with a name on it. Yeah. And people who don't know what they're smoking will not. There's no reason they would pick one over the other. There's no brand loyalty. If you yeah. yeah. Um, which is why you see a lot of brands that still have that very like traditional style, like take Arturo Fuente um, or my father, like they stuck to that traditional style of artwork. Um, you can't really tell one cigar from the next unless you really know what you're doing but it's but from their perspective it's a like tip of the hat to yeah where cigars came from yep um if we lose that i think we've lost kind of all of it in a sense because the, yeah. the history and tradition of cigars are important agreed um and I think when someone sits down and enjoys one, a part of what they're enjoying and acknowledging is the history. How did this end up here? Like, it's it's just a roll of leaves. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's so much history behind it. And um, so to answer your question, I think we're, we're moving in the right direction legislatively to be able to keep these things in our hands in the way that we know them now. But it's a very fragile line we're walking on. Okay. Um, and I think when the FDA threatens the industry with things like don't put like food that kids might like on your labels, or just little things that are like, like we all know we're not marketing to kids. No one, everybody knows that. Yeah. But don't give the FDA reasons to think that we might be. So back to your question, I think um, I, I'm optimistic that this will be around for a long time. Um, 
and I think you can take just the whole we'll say hipster culture of, of art and design and all of that um I think cigars are kind of entering that space of this is a craft product mm -hmm. and if it's art then nothing the restrictions and then limitations that it should have become a lot looser yeah um and if and if you're marketing especially for us like if we're telling stories about the people behind it we're not just flat out marketing products we're not telling people you should go smoke cigars yeah. we're just saying you should get to know this person and here's what yeah. they happen to do um and i think if if the industry as a whole kind of has that attitude towards it it'll last a lot longer and and it's and it's worth uh participating in yeah and not not everybody's gonna gonna enjoy it not everybody's gonna approve of it um and you don't have to but for those of us that do um there are simple steps we can take to keep these things going but then you watch the arguments in court in congress whatever of arguments against it and they're just overly just incoherent and you can it's pretty clear like oh this person was paid by whoever to speak against this gotcha and yeah. um i think society as a whole can kind of see through the bullshit a little yeah. bit yeah um but for those of us who actually enjoy this stuff and, and care about it it's a it's a, it's a pretty simple thing and and i would say that tobacco will be the last thing to get uh shut down in the u.s mm. of, of, of the three of alcohol and tobacco which okay. is super interesting because we saw the prohibition just fail miserably yeah um but then it's like the broader perspective or the, the sorry the more specific perspective is the argument wouldn't be against tobacco it'd be against cigars and clearly people who are getting paychecks to legislate um certain pieces of political legislation are not to get into the weeds politically but there's absolutely no way they're not getting paid off by companies like philip morris yeah um to keep philip morris going and i don't think there will ever be a time in history and this is someone like i've worked with philip morris printing their packaging and i don't think this is an nda issue but they're not going anywhere <laughs> like yeah, yeah, yeah. cigarettes yeah, are cigarettes are not going anywhere they're up there with pharmaceutical that's going to stay there forever and so it's interesting to watch the attack on cigars specifically and and maybe it's not as big of an issue but we see it as being people who are in the industry fans of the industry um but people on the street walking around have no pulse on what's actually happening politically with the cigar industry so i never understood what the win is for politicians to fight it that's always confused me. I understood the vape thing because it's like getting into high schools and all that, but the libertarian side of me is like, let people do what they want to do. Yeah. Well, you know, in one of your other videos, I think it was, I think it was Patrick with PCA yeah. um, asking about like, is it just sheer laziness? Um, you know, yeah. that is just like it, including tobacco <laughs> as an umbrella term because like clearly it's very broad you and i are smoking right now is not cigarettes right like and even, I, was just in a, I was just in la and there's a dispensary on every block it's like clearly the, substance abuse is not their <clears throat> concern well, well and, like, and the same as in denver like you can yeah. that's the thing is like okay heaven forbid someone um opens a cigar lounge to smoke where they want in their own building but weed stores are everywhere <laughs> like come on man like yeah you know and, and and i also personally i don't smoke weed but yeah, i also don't have a beef on it either like right. you want to smoke in your own house like or wherever you want do what you want to do there's um maybe never but, been a criminal case against someone who got violent because they're high yeah but like <laughs> it, it doesn't, doesn't i don't know it doesn't affect me who cares 
Yep. You know, I think to be honest, I mean, not to get into the weeds, but like, I think alcohol is way more in terms of a danger is oh, yeah. damaging in terms of drunk driving and, you know, stuff like that, that like, I, I, I don't think uh, another prohibition will ever happen because it's going to happen whether you like it or not. But I mean, look at COVID when COVID happened, like, holy yeah. crap. Like, I don't know about uh, Wisconsin, but like when COVID happened, two things in Colorado, alcohol stores were open during COVID and weed stores, like pe- mm-hmm. within minutes of them proposing the idea that weed stores be. Yeah. I don't, and we was, won't get into the weeds with that, but I've, yeah, I've learned, a, I've, I've learned yeah. a lot about that side and some of the people you've been able to but, talk to and it's money, but heaven forbid someone Early, wants to go like, you know, if, Look, man, if if cigars offend you and you don't want to be around cigars, don't go in a cigar lounge. It's so easy like, to avoid. Period. Even when you're in no. Spokane with Matt, it was like I was about to light up a cigar on the sidewalk and he's like, you might not want to do that. Because it's technically illegal in the state. It's like, it's a cigar. But you can smoke weed walking down the street. You can yeah. smoke cigarettes. What a weird double it's standard. A very is, odd know? thing. And I don't, yeah. I'd, I'd like to know how we ended up there. Um, and I don't think there's an answer. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, other than where is the most money for politicians to be made? And it's cigarettes, weed, other substances, pharmaceutical, whatever. Um, and I think cigars is one of those that maybe doesn't make them enough money. So they're like, just can it because it's not it's a really small percentage of tobacco sales and i've been to I've, for example i've been to the philip morris plant half of 0.1 and that place is harder or something. yeah it's harder to get into the philip morris plant than the white house there's a reason for that because okay. like yeah. we don't want you to know what what we're selling you and when you look into the production floor and people are wearing hazmat suits, like that's a problem. They're not wearing latex gloves and masks. They're wearing hazmat suits. Mm. Uh, so it's like OSHA cares enough to not let their customer or their employees be exposed to whatever they're selling. But on the other side of it, they will do everything they can to make money off that industry. Mm. Um, which is just interesting to see. And then alcohol like my wife is a therapist and it's like alcohol is when someone when one of her (laughs) clients is like i smoke weed she's like i don't care like that's not yeah that's a different there's a difference when you're relying on it to function in life um but when someone's like it is recreationally yeah like that's not that's not what we're here to really dig into that's maybe a subtle symptom of something if it's an addiction. Um, but alcohol, it's like, okay, now this is dangerous. Yeah. Um, and like we say this while we're drinking. And so it's like to clarify this, it's like, why are you going to drink? It's a, it's the why behind everything you do. Um, and I've had people ask, like, how, how are you okay with promoting alcohol? And we're like, we're not promoting alcohol abuse. We're, we're promoting the enjoyment of a product. And I had a conversation last night with the bartender at Tasting Room and, and he's like, we have to cut people off. We have to be responsible because this is a responsibility for us to be able to deliver a product that people can enjoy. But it's also something that comes with like a high level of responsibility yeah, from the user and from the people selling it. Um, and that's something he's like, I have to be aware of constantly with my customers. Uh, and it's, it's a responsibility, but I've never met someone that chain smokes cigars. <laughs> Man, you'd get so so when never I a... when I have conversations with my clients that know that I have a podcast, a cigar podcast, they they ask like, you know, it's like, man, if you're talking about the amount of nicotine or or the amount of to you know tobacco, like a whole pack of cigarettes is probably like you know, like the amount of tobacco itself is probably in there that's why we don't inhale cigars right yeah like probably mess you up it'd mess me up if i was inhaling this whole thing like crazy if i i would any 
I, I would be not okay. I'd be probably puking my brains out. Um, and, but I think with anything, it's in moderation. Yep. And um, like you and I having this conversation, we're not, you know, smashed, you no. know, doing that because we're drinking nice stuff. We are smoking nice things and we're not, you know, you know, um, abusing it. And yeah. uh, that's a different kind of person. I think, I you think know, it that, goes back to why are you doing it? Yeah. Cigars, is looking... pretty, it's a pretty weird thing to be like, I had a really bad day. I'm going to smoke a cigar to escape. Like, that's just not what people do. I, alcohol, I don't do that. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a bad day. And I'm like, uh, I'm going to go have a cigar. Like, I'm angry. I'm, I'm pissed <laughs> yeah. off. I'm going to go smoke a cigar. Alcohol, yeah. that's a different That's a different world. Um, like Jordan Peterson says, it's a great drug, but it's dangerous. Um, and it's accessible. And I think there's a there's a gravity to that and a respect that that it needs to carry with it. Um, and then the other thing we we work in is firearms, and it's not um, it's like because we're pro firearms doesn't mean we're pro violence in public, like like school shootings and stuff like that. Like what crazy like, people? It's would... Like why do people think that um, because you believe that people should be able to have firearms believes that you're pro innocent people getting shot it's like that's not how that works and you can get into the morality behind war they can get into into debates in the weeds forever about it um but it's i think it, it boils down to people should be able to make the decisions that they believe they need to make to protect their family protect themselves their community um usually defunding something especially when it comes to security is not the best option and um or can we just it's it's just there there's a responsible way to approach heavy topics that are that are in the interest of embettering the user embettering the community around them um and to, to translate that to cigars it's like if you can get to know people in your community that you would never have talked to before that you happen to meet in a cigar lounge like that's a win mm-hmm. like i've met so many people here or at other lounges that i've built personal relationships build business relationships whatever just because the cigars would brought us together if this just didn't exist we would have never met um if this didn't exist i'd probably still be working in a print shop it's a good job i'm not crapping on them i've, I've got a lot of good relationships there um but like it has changed the trajectory of people's lives. Um, and on top of that, if that's the vehicle that it took to have conversations that other people hear that that change them, challenge them, influence them, then then I think that's a win. Yeah. Um, and so there is I think there is a weight to anything that brings people together because people come together and do something. Like it's pretty rare that people will get in, into a group and then just be stagnant and do nothing. Like usually something's going to come out of that. Good or bad. Good or bad. Um, and usually what comes out of people getting together and sitting down and taking time with each other with a cigar is a good thing. Uh, so that's something that we're, we're not like everyone needs to go smoke cigars. But if you're someone who wants to, I think you'll find some really good people surrounded by that. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, man. I, I just think that the, going back to slowing down and appreciating what it is that you have is just it's slowing down and appreciating the times that you have with the people that you're spending it with. Yeah. And I, to this day, I've never had a bad experience doing that with another human being. Yeah. Never, never. That's rare. Never experienced that. Yeah. One of the one of the YouTube channels that just confuses me but challenges and it's just cool to watch is soft white underbelly talk to a few people about this lately okay google that and you'll just go down a rabbit hole he soft soft white underbelly okay and then mark he he's probably in his 50s i'm guessing he's 
his studio is on Skid Row in LA, which is just like the worst place for homelessness, drug addiction to be there. Yeah, just it sucks. Like we drove through there a couple weeks ago. Like Matt's studio is like there. Yeah, and I remember when we were going to record with them, I'm like, this is nuts. Because you look at it and it's like Johnny Depp's apartment building where the whole Amber Heard thing happened is like across the street. You're like okay. Lamborghini on the street, but then you look over and there's a guy shitting next to Lamborghini. And you're like, it, it's weird. And you're like, this is just if society lets loose and people do not care about their state of mind, financial security, anything. Like they've just let, let go. And it's like the Wild West, but in the middle of LA. Um, but so this guy uh, for Software Underbelly, he will just pull people into his studio, turn the camera on. He's behind the camera, so he's not on camera. And he's like, let's just talk. So he'll ask them super pointed questions, whether it's homeless people, prostitutes, people who are like currently tripping out on whatever drug you can think of. Um, and he just lets them talk. And it's just this very open, no one in society wants to listen to you, so I'm going to give you a platform. And then usually that comes with some sort of financial support from him to them. Because mm. he's got enough popularity where he gets donations, he gets funding for his videos. Um, but he's like, let people talk who society doesn't usually listen to. Um, and so he's a good example of like, like what I said earlier, like I'll have a beer with anybody. <laughs> um, and I think a cigar is similar where like people will kind of unload their life story just because you found a very simple bit of common ground and and just here's where I'm yeah. at. Yeah. For people that are like, I'm struggling with my family, I'm struggling with my wife, I'm struggling with whatever. And like you wouldn't have that conversation with anybody anywhere else. <laughs> Because you've like both committed to just sit there, yeah. It 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 becomes really interesting. Mm. Um, I think, like, I'm a Christian, not not to like replace the church, but I think that's a very similar world of like what the church was supposed to be, what it was intended to be was community, people being open with each other. Um, and I think the cigar lounge is kind of not replaced it but it's 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 a similar demographic of like let's get a community together and just get to know each other yeah and then i think something good can actually come out of that but it yeah. takes time it takes effort um so it's cool what, what cigars can do and and our hope with the publication is that we can kind of shed light on the non-contentious points of with cigar industry and the gun industry and just let people talk about what they're passionate about. Yeah. People might find that as for lack of better words, a gateway into those industries. Um, and then gain like, a, Oh, they're not just some chain smoking acrobat hippie. That, that's like, yeah. Wanting to just drink all the time and smoke. Just drink like, all no. the time and shit on the street. <laughs> like we, we've got another story with um, in this next issue with Griffin armament. And it's Austin and Evan Green. They're two brothers that were like sniper qualified guys in the army. Ended up working for the State Department, whatever that means, doing all kinds of stuff combat wise. Um, I remember when we met them, they're in Watertown of all places, which our town has 20, 25,000 people. Um, nothing that interesting happens there. And they make suppressors. That's their business. Okay. And like we showed up there to interview them and right away. I'm like, oh, this is like not going to be that interesting of a conversation because they're just like machine operators, military guys. They just, just sort of settled into what they do. And then they start talking and you're like, oh, wow, these guys are geniuses. First off, engineering geniuses to be able to produce the products they're making. And then the story of why they decided to make suppressors what they think the use case for the military for civilians for whatever just like opens up and no one would have first off known they're there unless you're looking to go buy that product um and then they're just fascinating people super smart care about the community 
and they're in your backyard. That right, like, that's yeah. that's what we want to highlight. Highlight. That's really cool. Who are people that you wouldn't listen to? Who probably, mm -hmm. if they were in any leadership role in your community, things would be different. Yeah. So how do we yeah. how do we elevate them? Or there's yeah. a guy named Mitch Brulette. I don't know if you listen to his. Um, that would be an interesting one to go listen to. Um, Patrick interviewed Mitch twice now. Uh, he's in Orange County, I believe Orange County, somewhere somewhere in that area. California uh, or Florida? California. Okay. Um, he was a police officer, school resource officer, which is one okay. of those roles as a police officer that people just kind of write off. They're like, oh, you just monitor kids. Um, and he was in like this really shitty high school, like just violence, gang activity, drugs, whatever. Um, if you just Google Mitch Roulette on YouTube, okay. you'll find yeah. this video that the students made where they hosted this huge pep rally for him because they're like, this is what school resources, resource officers are supposed to be, especially in the heat of the whole defund the police thing. Um, and they're like, he's not against us. He's not trying to like reel us in he's trying to help us yeah um and so they like basically kind of pulled a prank on him which resulted in this huge rally for him in support of what he's doing <laughs> cool um it felt like one of those like intros to america's got talent videos where i still like, hear someone's story <laughs> and there's this huge rally yeah. uh but now his his company that he works for is called uh i don't know if he owns it or works for it but um delta tactical oh, yeah. And they train SWAT in the area and across the country on how to react to school shootings okay. or active shooter situations specifically in schools. Um, and he's like, first, you have to flip the script on people listening to us as law enforcement. Um, and then show them that we actually care about the people there, the students, the community, and then give them tools to actually walk away and then be safer and better themselves mm. whatever so just it's how do we give these people a platform and i think that's uh i just society as a whole i think that's what we that's what we need a lot more is just understand take time to listen to people um not to bring it back to cigars but to bring it back oh, to cigars I, I think that's uh it forces you to sit and listen, especially when the person you're talking to, let's say the conversation gets awkward and they start unloading on you. They see how far you are with your cigar and that you came here to smoke a cigar. So they're like, I know you're stuck. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah. it is a visual representation. Uh, it's it's your hourglass of like, I have at least this, this long to unload my problems on you. This has been great. Oh. Thanks well, for meeting me, man. I, yeah, I genuinely you too. thank you for the invite. This is great. Thank you very much. All right, man. I hope to see you soon and I'll keep in touch with you on Instagram and, and absolutely you got my number. We'll uh we'll and, connect. And I'll look forward to the next uh, magazine subscription. I'm waiting in anticipation. Yeah, you'll get one. So awesome. Sounds man. good. Sounds Talk good, Alec. Thank you so very much, man. Bye. Have a good night.